Good evening. It's 7 p.m. and I'd like to open the November 18th school committee meeting. This meeting is being held virtually through Zoom. The town of Littleton began conducting remote participation Zoom meetings pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law on March 19, 2020. Since that time, unanticipated legal concerns relating to the open meeting law have been brought to our attention by the town clerk. Those concerns were supported by the Attorney General's Office and confirmed by Town Council. One concern is that the chat function allows a parallel text conversation to a board's public meeting. Chat is essentially running commentary that is occurring, but is not moderated or followed by the chair. All participants and listeners may not be aware of comments being made because some meeting participants join by phone and do not see these conversations. Another concern is conversations between residents within the chat room which are not incorporated into the public record. In response to these concerns, the town will implement the following changes which in no way prohibit any member of the public from participating in discussion and sharing information during a public meeting and will ensure that all listeners and participants have equal access to this meeting. People that join the Zoom meeting are set so their microphones are muted. If you called in by phone, please use the star six to mute or unmute your phone so that the meeting can occur in an orderly fashion. We ask that people who join keep their microphones on mute so background noises do not interfere with the meeting. If you wish to participate in the meeting, please use the raise your hand function available on Zoom or if you called in by phone, dial star nine, which will activate the raise your hand function. The meeting host will notify the chairperson of the raised hands and the chairperson will determine whether and when to allow public comment. When called upon, participants should unmute, then state their name and address. After speaking, we request the participant return their microphone back to mute. Okay, uh, we have a consent agenda from uh, uh, consent agenda minutes and oath the bills and payroll from October 28, 2021. I'll make a motion to accept the consent agenda minutes and oath to bills and payroll from October 28, 2021. Second. Motion made and seconded. This is a roll call vote. Brad? Brad Austin votes yes. Jen? And Gold, yes. Timelin. Timelin Rossi is yes. Justin. Justin McCarthy, yes. And Hunt votes yes as well. Okay, this is the first section in our meeting for interested citizens. Do we see any hands raised, Dorothy? We do not have any hands raised at this time. Okay, uh, then we will turn it over to Maddie Shuffin to begin the student representative report. Okay, so starting with Shaker Lane, some updates we have from them. Um, Parent-teacher conferences began last week, which were both well attended in person and virtual. Um, Shaker Lane would like to thank families for taking the time to meet with teachers over the past two weeks, and they also want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Um, some updates from Russell Street. Last Friday, the PTA sponsored family bingo night for the um, different Russell Street families. Russell Street School also had its first book, wear, book fair this week. Every class visited the library to view the books and make their wish lists and purchases. Parents were also welcome to come in during the day to visit the book fair as well. Russell Street would also like to give a th special thanks to the Russell Street PTA. They also had three afternoons of conferences and evening conferences. The teachers were pleased to have so many parents participate in that. Russell Street also had its annual food drive for loaves and fishes and the box in the lobby are quickly filling up. Um, a quick update from the middle school. The middle school had its spirit week this week with a lot of students and staff dressing up to show their little to middle school pride, which was great to see. Um, the NJHS, National Junior Honor Society, is currently working on a food drive for loaves and fishes, um, and they can always use more donations to help others this holiday season. Um, in regards to the high school, um, term one grades close November 12th. Um, tonight, actually, the Littleton class of 2025 is doing a fundraiser at Anthony's. Um, starting tomorrow, the LHS drama production of Stage Door is at 7 p.m. And then on the 20th at 2 and 7 p.m. And on the 21st at 2 p.m. Um, for students and seniors, the cost is $7 and the general mission, the cost is $10. The tickets are available online at littletonhighschooldrama.com or they're available at the door. Um, on November 23rd, term one grades will be posted to Aspen. 
Um, also on November 23rd, the Powder Puff game will be at 6 o'clock at Alumni Field. Um, on November 24th is an early release day, and then we have Thanksgiving break. Coming back from Thanksgiving, winter, winter sports will be starting. And a little bit into the future, on December 18th, the NHS is doing a gift wrap and babysitting event at the high school from 10 to 3. Um, so just a little bit update on that. And that's all I have. Great. Thanks, Maddie. Uh, I'll turn it over to Principal Harrington uh, for a little information on the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship. Yeah, tonight we're happy to announce uh, that we had 13 seniors who have qualified to receive the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship. The scholarship entitles recipients to free tuition upon acceptance to a Massachusetts State University or college. And the following students qualified for this scholarship based upon their performance on the MCAS test taken during the sophomore year. Aiden Donovan, Madeline Kiernan, Kula Kula Keshab, Cynthia Kong, Vivian Lance, Ann Lee, Heather Luciano, Sarah McDonald, Jonathan McGarren, Will Palea, Shea Regan, Emmy Richards, and Gabe Silks. We congratulate all of our students who earned this distinction and scholarship. The Adams Scholarship presents another option for them as they consider where they will attend college. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Quenchy, did you wanna I recognize the Mighty Oak Fund? Sure, thank you, Matt. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Mighty Oak Fund, uh, really uh, sponsored by Bobby uh, Crinch, uh, for their generous donation of $4,000 to our district. Uh, the Mighty Oak Fund has been uh, donating money to our district for a number of years. And we're very grateful for that. Uh, we use the, these funds to uh, purchase enrichment activities for classrooms, bring in guest speakers, uh, specialized uh, technology such as uh, Ozobots and uh, Spheros. So very grateful for uh, the support that the Mighty Oak Fund gives us. So thanks uh, again to Bobby Crouch. And I do have one more uh, recognition tonight, Matt. Uh, uh, as all of you know, we held our uh, age 5 to 11 vaccination clinic on November 8th. Uh, it was a great success. Uh, special thanks to everyone who uh, helped support the, the evening. Uh, it was a joint venture between the school district and the town of Littleton. We were able to uh, inoculate or give vaccinations to uh, 400 students uh, age 5 to 11. Very impressive number. Uh, the Vax bus and Vaccinate uh, will be back on November 29th to offer the uh, second uh, vaccination for those students. And we're anticipating that we'll have uh, walk-ins from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. It'll be held at the middle school. Uh, the next clinic, though, we will not be using the Vax bus uh, for vaccinating. It's a little cold out there, so we're going to be using the middle school gymnasium. Great. Thanks, Dr. Clenchy. Uh, Brad, did you have a recognition you want to? Yeah, I did. I, I just wanted to um, to thank Dr. Clinchy, the town administrator, and everyone else who worked on the vaccination clinics. Um, we did not have an appointment for Phoebe, but Legina, uh, my wife, was out there um, about seven thirty and waited, and didn't get her vaccinated about eight forty five that night. But Dr. Clinchy was still there. The town administrator was still there. Lynn Snow was still there, and just appreciated all they did to make this available to our community. I think earlier than almost any other community got it. And appreciate the leadership they all showed by by staying to the end to make sure it works. So I just want to say I appreciate that. Um, I also want to say that um, as I was reading back through the minutes, I um, wanted to apologize to Jason and his team, but also to recognize them. I, I was reading back through the minutes, and I, I realized that um, although Dr. Clinchy um, recognized the U.S. News and World Report kind of recognition in the middle school, no, our eagerness to get on to other things, no members of the school committee spoke up. Um, and just wanted Jason and his team to know how much we appreciate all the work they're doing um, and the fact that it's getting recognized um, is, a, uh, is a testament to their work and it's a, it's a benefit to our town. So, so thanks, Jason. Sorry we didn't, didn't say it last time. Nah, quite all right. No worries. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. Please share that with your team, Jason. I'm sorry. I absolutely will. Okay. Now we're going to move on to presentations. We have Athletic Director Mike Lynn to give an update on Littleton Public School sports. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here tonight. I want to give everybody an update. And this update will be more about uh, the goings-ons of our athletics program as opposed to last year, which was focused on oftentimes how we would plan to run athletics during 
the, uh, the most intense time of the pandemic. But um, so we're somewhat back to normal. And uh, if we could just switch to the next slide. Our fall athletics, we operated all of our sports, all of our fall sports during the actual fall season. Uh, if you remember last year, we had a fall one and then a flex season in the spring that we termed fall two. But it was nice to bring everything back to the actual fall season this fall. Um, we were also able to play outdoor sports without any face coverings. And that obviously is uh, beneficial to, to student athletes to be able to play in that manner. Um, we had boys and girls cross country and we actually launched our, our middle school level of that sport. Um, we're, we're now going to have cross country middle school as well as outdoor track at the middle school level. Uh, whereas in the past years, those, those student athletes have been integrated into our varsity program, but now they have their own level within our program with the same coaches we've had, but um, it's been nice to finally get to that point. Uh, golf at the varsity level, field hockey at three levels, boys and girls soccer at three levels, football at two levels, and cheer. All in all, we had 17 teams this past fall, uh, 270 student athletes, and we played 201 contests all together. Um, next slide, please. Uh, our participation at the high school level. You can just take a look there and see uh, uh, that our participation was healthy across all of our sports. Um, this is just the high school participation, uh, varsity and varsity, and then those programs that have varsity and JV. Um, just leave that up for a minute so people can see where our student athletes fall as far as across our programs. Next slide, please. At the middle school level, you can see we had five teams um, cross country. As I as I mentioned, at, at the actual middle school level cross country was something new this year. Uh, hopefully, those numbers will grow. Uh, we had five boys and ten girls, but again, they're they're integrated into with our varsity programs, and they um, they do practice with the older kids and in the same coaches, but they have their own meets, and that was what was. Uh, was new this year. Uh, then you have middle school field hockey and boys and girls soccer as well. Next slide, please. Our varsity records, um, as far as just uh, how our varsity teams fared during the season. Uh, boys cross country obviously had quite a season, as did the girls. Uh, a lot of our teams did really. Uh, varsity field hockey had a very strong season, as you can see. Varsity girls soccer had their best season in, in over a decade. And uh, the only sport still going right now is varsity football and varsity cheer with one game left to play on Thanksgiving at home at 10 a.m. Next slide, please. You can see that uh, just uh, we had several teams reach, reach notable uh, benchmarks this season. Uh, no, most notably, our, our varsity boys cross country team, they were league champions, district champions and divisional champions, and they have one meet left to run. Um, they have the all state meet this Saturday. So best of luck to them as they try and win, uh, win another title potentially on Saturday. They have quite a team assembled this year. Next slide. Our girls cross country team was league champions, which they've done on multiple occasions now. Next slide. Our varsity field hockey team, uh, we've lost count how many times they've won league championships. They have uh, literally, I think they must be up to about 20 at this point. Um, it's all on our athletics website, all noted on there, but uh, they tend to do this um, more, more than they don't, honestly, but uh, they had quite a season and uh, traveled to, to the uh, Central Mass Tournament and then into the MIA Tournament. Uh, next slide. Like I mentioned, girls soccer uh, played a very competitive division and they were league champions for the first time in many years. Uh, had a nice run in the Central Mass Tournament and also in the MIA Tournament. Uh, one note about, this is quite a... Uh, 
quite a time in athletics in the state of Massachusetts. Not only are we trying to get back to normal operations, but it was also the first year of the launch of the statewide tournament by the MIAA. Um, so now there's a, now that there's the MIA statewide tournament, our central mass athletic directors association has, um, has taken on the charge of keeping a central mass tournament alive, which we piloted last spring and did a test run. And now we're, we did another round of it this fall so that we're still crowning central mass champions just by our own organization, which is CMADA or central mass athletic directors association of which I'm obviously a member and a participant. And um, we're, we're pretty happy that we're able to still crown central mass champions and also then go into the MIA statewide tournament. If anybody's wondering why I know that it was, quite a story in the media as it started, but um, the reasoning behind the MIA statewide tournament was to create an equitable situation across the state. But without a doubt, it does create some travel um, logistics that are very, very uh, challenging, and namely some very long trips. Um, but that's just something I think people are going to have to get used to, I guess, as we um, progress into this new model that we're following in the state. Uh, next slide, please. As we look forward to the winter season, it starts on the Monday following Thanksgiving. Uh, we have the following sports. We have boys and girls basketball across three levels, boys and girls indoor track only at the varsity level. Um, boys ice hockey, varsity and JV, those sports are all under, you know, quote unquote, under our roof, um, our programs. We have some co-op offerings as well to, to add more diversity. We have girls ice hockey uh that's westford academy that we participate with boys and girls swimming and diving we are with bromfield boys and girls alpine skiing we are with lunenburg and gymnastics which was new last year we're with groton dunstable so it should also be noted that boys ice hockey we bring in bromfield and parker school actually as of as of last year so in the winter when you get some of these more specialized sports um, the co-ops in a school our size give, give more opportunities to more students, also allow schools to offer these programs, which would be very challenging to offer um, from a participation standpoint if you did not have other schools joining. Uh, co-ops can be challenging as far as the logistics. You do have to be careful that you don't over-grant co-ops, but um, I'm comfortable that all of our co-ops are, are needed for our school and for the school that we guest or host with. And, uh, you know, as you can see, we're able to offer a quite, quite a, uh, a amount of offerings for our student athletes because of the co-ops. So all in all, we have 10, we'll have 10 uh, teams, just littles in public schools. We'll have 16 total and athletes in contests obviously are yet to be determined. And I think that's the last slide. Yes. Don't know if anybody had any questions about fall or winter athletics. It looks like Tim Lins has a question. Yep. Hey, do hi, Mike. Thank you for that. That was um, informative. Um, I just wanted to reach out about. Um, I've heard a few parents at the high school level talk about volleyball, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure. People were like, "Well, there's not enough gym time." I said, "Well, it's in the fall." I said, "You'd have to talk with Mr. Lynn." Um, what would be our reasoning for not, if there is a want for it, do we not have enough gym time? Would we not be able to offer that? Um, we could offer, it's not a matter of gym time because girls volleyball is a fall sport and boys right. volleyball is a spring sport. Okay. Um, we, we have talked about it over the years. Um, most of the schools, well, I should say, all of the schools in our league, we have a, we're in a 26 school league. Okay. The only school that is comparable to our size school that has girls volleyball is Air Shirley, who does not offer field hockey. They offer volleyball in place of field hockey. Um, and then they're, and then their offerings align with ours. The first school, if you're looking from the bottom of the league to the top of the league that, that offers girls volleyball is Hudson high school, which is, 
on the 700 student range. So you would be looking at schools other than here, Shirley, who does not have field hockey, you'd be looking at schools 700 through our largest school in our league is Wachusett with like 2,200 students. So you're looking at the 700 to 2,200 range of schools, okay. schools that we typically compete with, um, Bromfield, Lunenburg, uh, Tingsboro, um, Air, uh, not, I'm sorry, not Air Shirley, um, Maynard, you know, our, our, our normal schools that we compete with do not offer girls volleyball. So okay. if we were to offer girls volleyball, it would be against larger schools. And we're, we're not saying that we're, we're never going to have girls volleyball. It would also be the, the fifth sport in one season for, for that particular gender, which we don't, the, you know, we don't have that. Um, we, we have typically across our seasons, we have four sports per, per gender in the fall and the winter. Um, but you would be, you now have girls soccer, field hockey, girls cross country, cheerleading, and girls volleyball. Um, you know, question at, at what point can you offer all those sports and sustain all those sports? This fall, the, uh, the, um, the only way we had JV field hockey was with an eighth grade waiver. There was, there would have not been a JV field hockey team without that waiver. Um, you know, gr the soccer numbers were strong. Uh, we actually had to have cuts in girls soccer. Uh, the, the cross country numbers were, were, were okay. We're, were substantial or, or were, um, you know, met the amount we need to, to operate the team. But, um, can we offer girls volleyball and still sustain the sports that we're currently offering? That question remains, that question would remain, remain to be seen. Um, and there would be some need, need to be some retrofitting of our gymnasium in order to have competitive volleyball. That makes sense. Thank you. Yep. I just, everybody was guessing and I just wanted to ask, I wanted to go to the source and ask. <laughs> well, and I do know that, I do know that I believe there's some kind of a rec program for, for younger students. I'm not really sure. Um, people don't often realize that competitive volleyball is actually a different game than say PE class volleyball, or, you know, there's a lot to right. it in the schools that play it they pretty much operate like say we operate with girls soccer or girls basketball or any of those types of sports where kids are, are coming through a rec program system. We have it at the middle school level oftentimes, or maybe some sports we don't like lacrosse, but they play club. They play, um, you know, the same thing happens in volleyball where those students that are playing that sport at the varsity level in most schools, they're, they played a lot of volleyball. Um, I'm not sure we're there yet and you got to start somewhere, but, um, those are all, that's all dialogue that would need to be, would need to take place. And starting would be tricky because there aren't schools our size in our league that offer the sport. So you, you would be playing larger schools that are established volleyball programs. So there, there would okay. be challenges. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yep. Does anyone else have any more questions for Mike before Brad? I do. Uh, first of all, Mike, I um, want to congratulate you, your coaches, and your, your athletes for such great success, but also just to say how nice it's been to to see the athletes competing and to see uh, a lot of the community out there supporting. It's just, it's it's been really nice this fall, and um, and I'm really glad we did it. My my real question is, it's maybe it's more of a comment, but um, I'm sure you're aware of what's um, alleged to have been happening in Danvers um, with the, the Boston Globe reporting about some pretty horrific practices um, and for the last couple of years, I don't suspect, um, if you're not aware, I can elaborate, but if you are, I, I, there's probably no need to do it, but if they're, um, I don't suspect anything like that is happening in Littleton. I have no reason to think it is, but I imagine the Danvers school committee felt the same way. Um, I would just encourage you, um, you probably do this anyway, but encourage you to talk to your coaches to make sure, um, on the, in the locker room and other kind of places where teams gathering that are, um, just let's make sure we're, we're protecting all of our students and that we're living up to the high community standards we have, because um, we don't want anything like that here. I just had a winter, just had my winter coaches meeting last night. Um, certainly we talk about all those types of uh, 
topics during during that meeting and from academics to bullying to hazing to uh, race and racism and, and grades and academics or stressing grades and academics, all those topics, and hopefully have the right people um, leading the way. And um, yeah, we definitely want to uh, not not be a part of any of the uh, the next media story for sure. Well, it's, yeah, you certainly don't mean the media, but also we just don't our kids experience what those kids were experiencing. So I'm glad you're addressing it proactively and um, I hope we can continue to do so. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Any other questions or comments? Justin. I have a quick one. Um, Mike, first, uh, congrats again on the 150. That's oh, yeah, pretty cool. You. Nice job there. Can't, I can't, yeah, it seems like you're not old enough to have 150 wins. Yeah. But um, I echo Brad's comments. I attended a couple of football games, a soccer game, and just to see the students there and that student section and bring the community together, I think that was pretty powerful and something that we certainly needed this year. Um, my real question is along the lines of Timlin's was, is uh, from a trend analysis, student athletes, is that a growing thing, a shrinking thing? Or are we kind of holding level in terms of participation? So how, how are we doing? Well, it's, we'll know at the end of this year, certainly our fall participation. Um, football participation is down. I'm, you know, uh, just to give you an idea, in 2017, we – we had during my 20 years as head coach, we hit our peak uh, as far as participation. We had 58 players and we were at 33 this year. So uh, football is definitely trending downward, but boys soccer participation is up cross country. Participation is strong. Uh, girls soccer participation is very strong. Field hockey is also trending on the same direction as football participation is down. So, you know, you see those ebbs and flows in certain programs. Overall, the numbers are strong. It's hard to know. So pre-pandemic at the high school level, we were always in the 67, 68, 69% participation range. And I prepare a report uh, at the end of every, every school year and send that to, um, to Kelly. And I, and I believe I sent it to the school community members or I asked Kelly to forward it to, to you folks, but we were always there. It's been skewed because in um, the 1920 school year, we didn't play spring sports. So you know, we were only in like the 50% range. And then last year, we participation was absolutely down. No two ways about it. This year, it seems like participation is back to where it was. I won't know until we, um, I certainly can run the data on the fall based on, then basic, take a look back to 2019, uh, which I, you know, I, I will do. Um, but it's better to look at the, the year as a collective because it's hard to know how many students are going to play one sport, two sports, or three sports during the year, and how many of our students were going to have play at least one sport during the school year. And I'm hoping that we're going to get into that 65 to 70% range again. Uh, the highest we've been during my 17 years as athletic director was 69%. Kept trying to hit that 70% mark, but we haven't done it. So hopefully we're back. And we definitely saw huge kids that opted out last year, I've seen them come back. Um, the numbers have been strong. And I will tell you this. We ran a lot of night games at Alumni Field this fall. We didn't run any last year. Um, even football got played at 5 o'clock and, and not at night because we didn't want crowds. Um, but I've never seen students come out for soccer games and field hockey games like I saw this fall. Like um, – Four, four times as many students. Um, so I, I think they're making up for lost time, lost opportunities, or maybe it's just this, this group of kids that's at our high school right now, but they came out like I've never seen, honestly. Um, so that's been good too. Great. That's excellent to hear. Good luck with the participation. I hope uh, everybody bounces back and, and more. So yeah. thanks. Again. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, Mike. I appreciate the update and good luck with the winter season and good luck on Thanksgiving. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Next on the agenda is AP testing update from Dr. Harrington and Mr. Kamo. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be handing this off the majority of the presentation to Keith shortly. I just want to give a shout out and um, a note of thanks, particularly to the guidance department. 
Our school counselors, Jan Owen and Chris Christie did a phenomenal job organizing all of our AP students and AP teachers did an exceptional job in a very diff under difficult circumstances, the hybrid model, uh, preparing the students for um, their, their AP tests in May. Um, also, I wanted to give a, a special note of thanks to Nancy Manuelo, like I said, the school counseling office assistant for organizing so many college visits um, tied into the AP program, of course, is, you know, so much of it's about the college preparation and enhancement of transcripts for, to maximize students' admissions. And uh, just for the school committee's knowledge, uh, we had already at this point in the school year, a hundred opportunity for students to have um, a one, a face-to-face -face meeting or a virtual meeting with 103 colleges. And that, our small high school, that's pretty exceptional. 103 college reps made themselves available to Littleton students. And I think it's also a testament to the fact that they, our, our alumni have gone on to great success at so many nearby colleges and even co colleges that are far away come and visit Littleton uh, or make themselves, the college reps make themselves available uh, to meet with our students and recruit them for admission to their college. Uh, so that's been a great opportunity. Uh, I also, before, before we get into the AP results, I wanna note that we had a number of students last year, it seemed to be an uptick and the number of students who did not take the exam, but took the AP course. And I just wanted to note that, uh, that number of very high performing students opted not to take the test. Some of it was because their chosen colleges, the colleges were, they were really focused on, wouldn't accept the AP credit, even with, the, with an excellent result. So they chose not to uh, take the test and they pursued refunds. We actually issued, at least I believe it was like 40, there were 41 exams that we issued refunds for. And the college board last year made sure to grant full refunds. So that I think incentivized some students to pursue that. Um, and some students did withdraw from the AP courses. They, they felt that they weren't gonna be as ready uh, with the hybrid model uh, for the tests. And so they had sort of a question of whether they were ready to take the test and concerned about how they maybe would score. There were a couple of individuals with that situation. But the, uh, we're going to get into some really good results considering all that we had to con contend with last year. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Keith, who will uh, summarize the courses that we're currently offering. We offer a number of course, a substantial number of courses at our high school. Um, but we also make available online courses through virtual high school for our students for some AP courses that we can offer uh, for a variety of reasons, um, really unique courses. Uh, so why don't we hand it off to Keith? All right. Thanks, John. Uh, so the next slide that we have in the presentation is just a list of the courses that we're currently offering at the AP level at the high school. Um, most of them are, are pretty standard, what you've seen over the past couple of years, psychology, English lit, U.S. history. Calculus A, B, statistics, biology, physics C, mechanics, computer science, principles, French, Spanish, art history, studio art, and new this year was macroeconomics. That's a course that was added uh, this year at the AP level. Um, this is being taught by Mr. Fastukas. Um, so that's uh, new to us this year. On the next slide is, oh, that got really funky. Um, I'm not sure what happened with the formatting there, but it's, it is a list of the 16 courses that students took last year, the tests last year at the AP level. Um, for the most part, it's the courses that we offer here, um, but some additions are Calculus BC, which is the more advanced uh, AP Calculus course. English um, language and composition is something, a course that we do not teach here. We teach the English Lit course. Um, at some of the bigger high schools, you'll see AP English language as a junior course, and then AP English Lit as a senior course but we only offer English Lit here. Um, also, courses that were taking exams that we don't teach AP level here is Latin. Uh, we do offer Latin 5 here. There was a conscious decision made a, couple, a number of years ago by Mrs. Kelly, who teaches our, our Latin courses, that we taught Latin 5 instead of AP Latin. But m m many of the kids who take a Latin 5 course prepare themselves to take the AP exam at the conclusion of the year. We just don't follow the AP uh, curriculum. Uh, music theory is another another course that we had students take last year at the AP level on uh, VHS and took the test that way. Uh, and then we also see uh, chemistry and human geography, which students took through VHS that um, at the AP level and, and took the test at the conclusion of that year. So we do use VHS quite a bit, like John mentioned, to supplement our course offerings, um, not only at the AP level, but at, at, at the standard level and honors level as well. Um, 
offering a little more specialization in some of the courses that are offered on VHS that we just don't have the capacity to offer all of those at, at, at our high school. Uh, next slide. Um, so this, the next few slides are slides you've all seen before um, or over the years, just the updated versions of those slides. Um, so this first slide is the number of students who took at least uh, one AP exam last year. So we had 99 students that took at least one AP exam. Um, those 99 students combined take 186 AP tests. So obviously that, that shows that students have taken multiple AP tests, um, multiple AP courses. Um, pretty much online with where we have been over the, over the course of the past few years, this current senior class is a little bit smaller than, we, than we've seen over the past few years. Um, I think right now we're at 100 students on the, on, on the dot in our, in our senior class. So um, the AP participation is a little bit lower because they didn't all take AP courses last year. So the AP U.S. history course that they took as juniors was a little bit smaller. Um, but we're pretty much on, on, on target for where we've been in terms of the number of students taking the AP exams, but also the amount of tests that are being taken by our students. Uh, the next slide is, is a summary of the different, uh, the amount of students or student exams at each of the AP um, achievement levels. Again, the AP tests are graded between one and five, five being the highest. Um, and so we, we had 60 student exams at, at the, that were scored at the five level last year, 57 fours, 38 threes, 23 twos, and eight ones. And so the, the score of three is generally viewed to be the passing score on the AP exam, um, where they're the college credit is potentially transferable. The college um, impact is potentially transferable. So we had 155 student exams that were scored at three or better, which is 83% of all of those exams that were completed were viewed to be passing scores, which is a, a very high rate. On the, on the next slide, we, we see the breakdown of um, the past few years. Again, looking at the most recent scores on the on the far right of, of the screen um, is comparing back to the past five years. And you can, again, see that we're at a very comparable uh, achievement level to the, to the previous five years. Um, again, as you know, there's the highest amount of, of fives we've had in, in a number of years. Um, and our percentage of passing scores is um, on, on par with the others a little bit lower, but again, we, we take into account the, the situation that all the students and teachers were experiencing last year, um, very high achievement level for all of our students. Um, the, the next slide is just a visual representation of, of the scores over the, the past um, five years, including last year, and just the exact same results from the, the previous slide are in this visual representation. Again, this these previous two slides both include um, the students who took multiple exams. This is the, all the exams that were taken, not just each individual student. Uh, the next slide is a, a different view of, uh, of the results. Again, these are the number of students that scored at least three or above on at least one of their tests. Um, so we had 83 students who scored at least um, a three or better on at least one of their exams. And so of all the students that took an AP exam, 84% of our students scored at least a three on at least one of their exams. And so again, if, if you look at these numbers compared to the state or even nationally, they're, they're very strong results. Um, and they're, they are comparable to, you know, previous years. Again, a, a test or two here and there accounts for a pretty high percentage increase. Uh, the, the next slide just is a summary of the AP Scholar Program, just which kind of categorizes student um, achievement based on a, a variety of markers. The AP Scholar is granted to a student who receives a three or higher in three or more AP exams. The Scholar with Honor is averaging at least a 3.25 on all of their exams taken and grades of three or higher in four more exams. The Scholar with Distinction, again, is a 3.5 average on all of their exams taken and three or higher in five or more exams. And the National AP Scholar, which is actually discontinued this past year, uh, was a, a distinction that was given to students who scored at least a four on all of their exams and four or higher on eight or more of these exams. The, the National Scholar Program, I think, at least partially was discontinued. And in some regards, we're glad that they did because it was putting kind of an overemphasis on 
taking as many AP courses as possible. And as we've talked about with our, you know, our bell schedule stuff and our student stress level and all, and all of those conversations, we want students taking challenging courses, certainly, but we don't want taking students taking too many overly challenging courses and stretching themselves too thin in the hopes of, you know, chasing down this national AP scholar distinction, which is achievable for some, but very much a stretch and at most times uh, putting undue stress and undue workload on, on our students. So that was discontinued at the, at, at the national level. Um, so there's that. So on the next slide, we have a breakdown of the past number of years with the amount of students who qualify at each level um, for the AP achievement. This year we had 14 AP scholars, seven with, with honor, 11 with distinction. So again, a total of 32 AP scholars this year. Um, again, looking at the years past, where it's very comparable to the past seven years prior to this most recent test administration and graduating classes. So a few summary notes, again, 84% of our students scored at least a, a three on one exam and 51% of this graduating class or this most recent graduating class scored a three or higher on exam at least once in their high school career, which I think is a, a very positive statistic for our school and, our, and our, our overall student body that we have students that are taking challenging courses and doing well on them. Um, I, I think that the, the percentage from the, the class prior, I think was 43.6% had scored at least a, a three or higher on at least one exam, at least once in their high school career. So uh, this past graduating class was a little bit higher than that in terms of the percentage of students who are taking um, and doing well on very rigorous curriculum and on this test in particular. A couple other notes that this current year, AP Statistics and AP Calculus AB have two sections running um, just because of the demand that we had. They were both in the low to mid 30s in terms of student requests for participation in those courses. So we had, we did run two sections um, this year, which is a, a first for us and for have both of them having two sections the same year. Uh, again, macroeconomics is new this year. AP Art History is back this year after a short hiatus. Um, that, that, that is a course that is not run every year for us. Um, I think the last time we ran it was two years ago. It, we didn't have it last year, but now we have it again. Again, this year, I think our number is I think 10 or 11 students are taking that course this year. Um, and, you know, some of our current students have expressed interest in AP Computer Science A. Moving forward, we currently offer computer science principles as our AP course at the high school. Um, and we are, are looking to expand our computer science offerings. We offered a, um, an intro to programming course this year for the first time in, 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 a, in a while. And some of our students have opted to actually take the AP Computer Science A course through VHS in lieu of taking the, the principles course. It's because they felt the, the computer science A course was more the more like the, the programming coding piece as opposed to the, the systems organizational piece, which is what the AP Computer Science Principles course is. Um, that's what we have for tonight. Questions? Thanks. Keith, uh, any questions or comments from the school committee? Brad. Just to say, I continue to be impressed by the, the number of courses we offer and the quality of teaching and learning is taking place. Um, I know this last year was tough um, in all the classes, but especially trying to to teach college level classes um, in these conditions. And so, just congratulations, everyone. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, and I know talking with our teachers, they really noted how challenging last year was, um, especially for the AP courses because of the hybrid, um, the model that we ran from the majority of the year, and they were really impressed by the achievement level of the of the kids, um, and so. Well, and as you know, I mean, the timeline for the AP classes is you take the exams in late April, early May or so. So, you know, we're, we're missing, compared to a lot of schools down south or west, we're missing a month and a half of instruction to get our kids yep. ready for the same test. So um, doing this well is a, a real testament to the quality of instruction and the commitment 100%. of the students. Yeah. Any other comments? Or? No. All right. Thanks, Keith. Appreciate the presentation. Uh, Matt, uh, Miss Snow's running a bit late this evening, so could we uh, yeah. go All to right. the survey results first and then go back to uh, dyslexia and early literacy screening after that? Sure. So we're going to 
just uh, go a little out of order and we're going to move on to our mask survey res results. Um, wanna, uh, uh, Ms. Steele is gonna do that. Yes, thank you, Chairman Hunt. We'll just wait just a second for the slides to get up because there are some charts and graphs that would be helpful. Perfect, thank you, Steve. Okay, so there was an opportunity to complete a survey on mask flexibility. We can go to the next slide. We have some general information about the survey that went out. Oh, can we go back one slide, Steve? Perfect, thank you. So the, um, the survey went out on November 3rd and it closed on November 15th on Monday. Um, it went out to students, staff, and families. So to be a little bit more specific, it went out to students in grades 6 through 12 into their own personal LPS um, emails. And then it also went to all families, including the families of the students that were in, are in grades 6 to 12. The survey had seven questions, and we had a total of 938 responses. So we'll just go through the seven questions, what they were, and the responses that were provided. So question number one was just trying to figure out who was completed in the survey. So as you can see, we had 74% um, was family completing the survey, 9.9% .9 were students completing the survey, and 15.7% was staff completing the survey. Question number two, uh, we wanted to see, to make sure that all four schools were being um, somewhat equally represented, and you can see they are. Um, so roughly 30 or just under 30% came from each school building. Question number three was uh, asking if, if the person had consented to being part of the district's COVID-19 testing program. As you can see, 76% uh, responded with yes and 24% responded with no. The follow-up question to that, question number four was if you had selected no, so if you are, have not consented to being part of the testing program, if you would be comfortable sharing with why you have not consented at this time. There were a variety of responses going from um, already vaccinated and don't feel necessary to do the testing program because of that, or already had COVID-19 and do not feel or want to be part of the testing program because of that. There were 164 responses um, or comments made for this question all comments were shared um, with all school committee members to be able to read all of them. So what you see here is just a, a selection of, um, or an overview of the responses that were provided. Question number five asked, um, what potential data points would you like to see the district consider after a school reaches an 80% vaccination rate, but before becoming mass flexible? Um, it's a conversation that we have had at school previous school committee meetings. And so you can see here, there's a variety of responses, a variety of um, rates for different ones. The top three um, consist of in-school transmission, which had 631 responses. The second one, the, top, the, the second top one was the number of positive COVID-19 cases in a school over a four week period. And that had 614 responses. And then the third one, was community um, COVID-19 case rates for the community and regional data. And that had 557 responses. The next question, um, which this was the purpose of the survey. Um, it is where the focus lied in actually why we wanted to complete this survey. Um, all of the questions provided helpful information and data, but this was really to the point of the survey to gauge where our public sat with the question of go, moving into potentially mask flexibility. And so the question was, if your school reaches a total vaccination rate between students and staff of at least 80 percent, 
would you like the option for individuals to take their masks off if fully vaccinated? Unvaccinated individuals would um, continue to be required to wear masks indoors. And here is where you can see 51.4% checked off yes, 32.7% uh, per checked no, and 15.9% are undecided at the time of completing the survey. The final question was really a space for comments. Um, and so uh, again, there was a range of comments on this um, going from wanting masks to be taken off immediately to the other end of the spectrum of wanting masks to be worn for the entire 21-22 school year. Again, all of the comments that were made um, were shared. So all committee members um, were able to read every single comment that was submitted. On, on the screen that you see here um, is a collection of kind of the gist overall of the responses that were provided. So um, lots, lots of comments, lots of information um, to, to, to read and to analyze, um, but thank you to everyone who completed the survey um, and there's the information for you. Uh, questions or comments from board members? Justin. Yeah. Um, thanks, Beth. Um, I will let everyone know that and thank everyone that submitted the survey because I did, in fact, read every single comment that was submitted and I found those helpful. I see many other school committee members nodding. So they were all read. Um, I will say that I think this response rate was um, not enough um, to really put any stock or credence in the survey results, unfortunately. Um, the survey was sent to sixth through 12th graders. So that's got to represent at least 800 individuals. And we only heard back from 93 students. So we, we heard back from 93. I, I thank those that submitted a response, but I'm not able to draw any conclusion in terms of how the questions were answered uh, personally. So I think I would just take this as maybe like a lesson learned if we do want to hear from our community again, maybe we need to try a different strategy because that was like a, about 11% response rate from the students um, didn't do it for me in this case. But we asked for a survey, we got a survey out, we got some comments back. I, I, you know, I, got, some, I got some information from it, which was helpful, but we, I just, just didn't get the response rate I was looking for from particularly the students. So that's all I'll share. Yeah. Thanks, Justin. Um, I, I want to also highlight that um, I think another thing that I learned from this was that um, the, I think it was question number five, which asked for which additional criteria would you be interested in considering in addition to an 80% plus vaccination rate for mask flexibility. Um, we heard from a number, I heard and personally, and also it was in the comments from a number of parents that um, the option to select none was not given. And that's a flaw. I think that was an, an, a mistake. I think that was accidental, not intentional. But I mean, scientifically, the option to choose none of the above should be included. And I think that did skew the results to some extent. So just want to point that out to give voice to the people who communicated that to us. Um, I also think, you know, I, I'm guilty. My, my middle schooler I didn't even really think about the fact that the kids were going to get this survey in their email. She told me that um, her email is clogged with stuff that she barely can get through and she didn't even see it. So I think um, maybe just better communication about the fact that us parents should get on our kids to answer the survey for, in their own email. Um, that is a, is a woeful you know, response rate from the kids. I agree. It would have been better to hear from more of them. Yeah. Red. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that um, I agree. I wish, wish wish we had more information from the students, but we did have 900 something responses. That's not, on the whole, that's not necessarily a, a woeful response. Um, it may not give us the information, especially if we're interested in what the students wanted. Um, it doesn't give us that information. I agree, a 10% response rate among students isn't great. Uh, but we did get a lot of information. Um, I saw the same comments Jen did about um, frustrations with question five. Um, and the ability to choose no none. A lot of people chose NA, um, which maybe it serves as a proxy for, for none, but isn't the same thing. 
but again, as Justin and others have said, the um, the comments were, were, were instructive and in some ways um, quite sobering. Um, and I appreciate everybody who did fill it out because 900, it's not, it's not nothing. Right. Yeah. I think the, obviously it would have been desirable to have more student responses. I'm not sure how to go about that as far as uh, you know, getting even my own freshman and seventh grader to do it is like pulling teeth um, to get them to actually sit down and take a survey that's optional. Um, so I don't know whether we can have them do it in school or, uh, or just rely on parents to, or just better communicate in school that they should take it if they're interested. Um, but we can probably do better on that in the future. Uh, any other thoughts before we move on? Yeah, Matt, just a, a general comment here. Uh, we've been very fortunate through the pandemic with the other surveys that we've administered to get higher than usual participation rates. Uh, a particip participation rate like we saw in this survey is more typical of what we find in surveys and in any district uh, throughout the Commonwealth and beyond. So it's not something that, that's an anomaly. It's more of what normally happens when we administer surveys. So I just wanted to, to make sure that you understood that as a group. Uh, for somebody that's administered a lot of surveys in my career and in my doctoral work, uh, it, it, it takes a, a lot of extra work to, to uh, get a decent survey response. And, and by decent, I don't mean 80%. So I think that's worthy of noting. Uh, also, you know, we, we, we could try to promote these things a little more, but the bottom line is if, if people are interested in a topic, they will figure out a way to fill out that survey. So again, I, I think we have to hold people uh, accountable as well to, to the survey. And, and when we designed this survey, the whole intent of this was to determine whether people were on board with max flexibility. We added some questions because we wanted to probe a little more. We did discover that question five was problematic and within an hour, hour and a half, we, we added another uh, NA response. It could have been none, I guess, but our primary purpose and, and our charge more or less was to focus on how people thought about mask flexibility. So just wanted to throw those comments in. I wanted to make sure we kept, kept this in perspective in terms of what surveys typically bring in terms of results. I, I just say, and thanks for that, um, for that context, Kelly. And, and our, you know, our, our comments are in no ways kind of, um, meant to criticize you or, or, or Beth or whoever designed and um, implemented the survey. Again, 900 responses is, is significant. Um, and so this data, it has all the problems that all surveys do, but there is, there is something to be learned from looking at it. Thank you. Yep, I definitely think it was worthwhile. And like I said, I, I thought it was informative. Okay. At this point, I think we're going to move on to Lynn Snow for a presentation on dyslexia. Is, that, is Lynn here? I, I am here. Hi, it's, sorry. Just, it's a group presentation. It's actually Beth Steele, Michelle Kane, and I'll be um, I'll be wrapping up the end of it. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. All right. So we'll get started speaking about the early literacy and dyslexia screening. Um, update that was asked for. So tonight's presentation, Steve, if you can go to the next slide, please. It's a three-part presentation. So I will start with going over um, an overview of the regulations and the selected materials. And then I'm gonna pass it off to Michelle Kane, who is going to talk about the current implementation and assessment overview. And then as Lynn just indicated, um, she will wrap it up with um, kind of the next steps and after the screener. So on the next slide, we see an overview of the regulations and the guidelines um, that led us to where we are now. So there really are two pieces of re one regulation, one guidance that came together for the screeners that we're discussing um, and providing an update, update for this evening. The first is that in recent years, um, there has been a push for improvement of early literacy education. And in 2018, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education started collaborating with educators to develop a literacy strategic plan. And in 2019, they released that plan um, out to the state. And the plan is called An Excellent Education in ELA and Literacy for All. And the plan focuses, um, has a focus on high quality core instruction 
as well as evidence-based early literacy. And part of the plan is that all schools serving grades K to two conduct a universal literacy screener in order to identify students who may be at risk for poor learning outcomes. So that's part one. Part two is the act relative to students with dyslexia. So as, as we previously discussed, the, this act was passed in 2018 with the purpose of ensuring that schools and districts are supporting students that demonstrate one or more um, potential indicators of a neurological learning disability, including but not limited to dyslexia. So both the literacy strategic plan and the act relative to students with dyslexia led to the creation of two sets of guidelines that can be used in tandem to ensure that all students um, are, are receiving and learning literacy skills. <clears throat> Both of the guidelines state a need for universal screening. Um, and there's a lot of options uh, in the education world when it comes to universal screenings. And so after doing research um, and diving into a couple of them, we ended up choosing uh, Ames Web Plus as our screener. And so this is a platform with which our special education um, educators in K um, to two are already familiar and are able to support our general education educators with implementation and with interpretation of the results from the screeners. So our Shaker Lanes uh, educators actually had professional development on Wednesday, October 20th to learn about the platform, the screener, and how to complete the various parts of the screener. As with anything new, uh, it takes time and cooperation to implement. So really a big thanks uh, here goes out to Michelle Kane um, and Rebecca Deacon and all of the Shaker Lane team for really leaning into this new screener. The Ames Web Plus screener does satisfy both the early literacy um, guidelines as well as the regulation um, with the, an act relative to students with dyslexia. And so we're, we're able to kind of cross off both of those things with this one screener of Ames Web Plus. And so I'll pass it over to Michelle, um, Principal Kane, who will dive into a little bit more of the actual components of the assessment. All right, thank you, Mrs. Steadley. Hello, everyone. Um, so I will give a little breakdown about kindergarten transitional grade one and grade two. Um, just to talk a little bit about um, kindergarten's assessments. These assessments, kindergarten and transitional, do take the longest. They are given individually. So um, it's a little different than second grade, which I'll talk a more about later. So they did take a quite, quite a bit of time. We are pretty much done with kindergarten. Uh, first grade, we'll talk about in second grade. So the first um, early literacy and reading uh, assessment that we give is print concepts. And this is, um, it's, it's a series of questions about a book. So we hand a child a book and we say, how do you hold the book? You hand the child the book upside down, sideways, backwards, and you want them to hold it like they would hold a book correctly. Can you point to the front of the book? Can you point to the title? Um, where's the first word on the page? Follow along with me when I read. So really just do they have those initial concepts that when you're a young child, your family reads to you, you follow along in the book. You just want to see if they have those skills. Um, initial sounds is a, um, this is where uh, children are given um, four pictures and you tell them the name of the picture. So in this one assessment um, is a picture of a corn, a penguin, a ball, and a feather. And you say to the children, point to the um, picture that starts with so you want to see if they have that initial sound of C, corn, um, point to the one that starts with F for feather. So that's initial sounds. Um, there's a few pages of those. Uh, the next assessment is letter naming fluency. And that is really just a series of uppercase and lowercase letters, um, about 10 rows of them. And the students have um, 60 seconds. They have, this, is a, this one is a timed assessment. And they just name as many letters as they can. Again, a mixture of uppercase and lowercase letters. Um, the next one, letter word sound fluency, that's actually the first photo that you see on the page there. And I put that one there because it gets a little bit harder as the kids um, progress or know their letter sounds. So you say, you say to this child, I want you to tell me the sound that this letter makes. So they have to say t, d, 
mm, and they go through. As they get a little bit older um, into first grade, they get a little bit further, or probably even in the winter assessment and the spring assessment, they have CDC words, um, like the word cat. The, instead of the T being there, a C will be there. So it'll be K. And then the second letter, instead of D, it will be C-A. So they have to say k -a. And then instead of N, they have the consonant vowel consonant word k -a. So you want to see if they can sound out each, um, each phoneme. And auditory vocabulary, there's also a picture of it there. That's a, a series of pages. Um, I'm sorry, letter word sound fluency is also a time test. So two time tests, one minute, letter naming fluency, letter word sound fluency, and auditory vocabulary. Um, a series of pages um, that look similar to this. And you say to the child, point to the grapes out of an array of four pictures. There'll be another four pictures on the next page. Point to the nest. Uh, point to the buckle. So it's really just the auditory vocabulary. Do they know the words that um, you're, the, the pictures that you're, of what you're saying? What we found interesting is some of our ELL students struggled a little with this, which makes sense because the, knowing those pictures, the word, the language is difficult for them. Um, the two pieces on the bottom, uh, the rapid automatized, automatized naming screener, they call the RAN, um, is a series of pictures um, where there are initially four rows of pictures. Um, we tell the students the names of the pictures, and then they have to go through and tell us the name. The set of pictures in the four rows is repeated again below. So they actually go through the four rows, and then they go through it again, and they just are trying how quickly can they rapidly name those pictures in their head. So that helps us with processing, um, figuring out processing speed for children. The Shaywitz Dyslexia Screener. Um, that one is different per grade level. So in kindergarten, um, for children who are ages five and six, there are 10 questions. Uh, I'm going to go through all three of them right now because I just don't want to repeat them on the next two. Um, in first grade, um, there are 12 items in those first students, six and seven-year-olds. And in grade two, there are 10 items, seven um, and eight-year-olds. And the dyslexia screener is a, um, it's, it's an age-based questionnaire for teachers. So there isn't, um, there isn't um, an assessment for the children. It's the teachers filling that out for the kids. So for example, there are, these are some questions I believe from the kindergarten one. Um, does the child um, show interest in books and reading? Um, how likely do you think it is that the student has a problem learning? Um, What's another one? Um, how often does the student speak in a way that is difficult to understand? And the, the responses can range from never, really, sometimes, often, almost always. So it's a survey that in conjunction with the early literacy and reading um, assessments can give us um, whether or not a child would be at risk for a dyslexia. So it's not like a, a pinprick blood test. It's just, hey, this is some red flags for this for the student. Let's look at some interventions that we can put in place. Um, and then you can progress monitor their assessments. I'm gonna skip over to slide two, please. Um, yep. So grade one, um, some of these are similar. Some are a little different. Uh, the phoneme segmentation, that is up there for you to look at. So it's, can the child break down each phoneme in the word cap? So C, A, P, K, A. Each one of those letters has a phoneme, so they call it phoneme segmentation. Can they break it down? So you say to the child, um, um, can you break down the word cap, k, ap? Uh, letter word sound fluency, um, same as kindergarten, couple of, word, couple of letters are different, and then the consonant vowel consonant words come up. Um, word reading fluency, these are sight words, so 60 seconds um, if you have children. I'm sure you're familiar with practicing sight words in kindergarten and first and second grade. So they have 60 seconds to uh, read as many sight words as they can. Auditory vocabulary. Um, auditory vocabulary is exactly the same as kindergarten. So the one I showed with the grapes, point to the grapes. It's the same assessment in grade one. Um, nonsense word fluency. So that's up there. This is really good to see if children have those phonemes and can be difficult for readers because readers look at these words and they, they don't make sense to them. Sometimes this is easier for non-readers because they know the phonemes. Eh, mm. But when a reader looks at these, you really have to break it down and say, these are nonsense words. We want you to say um, what this word sounds like. So for WK, we want to hear the child say, and actually sound out each phoneme. 
Um, and the last one um, is oral reading fluency, which we've been doing for forever. And this is second nature for the teachers. It's listen to the child read for a minute. Um, how how are they able to read? Are they able to self-correct? Do they have insertions? Do they insert, insert words? Do they substitute words? So the teachers are very familiar with this from doing um, DRAs years ago and more recently, the benchmark assessment system by Fontes and Pinnell. And then again, the RAN and the Shaywitz dyslexia screener I just spoke about. Uh, we can skip over to grade two. Grade one, just so everyone knows, we, we have a couple of students left to test in grade one. Um, and then grade two, we just did, the thing about grade two that's a little bit different is uh, the oral reading fluency that I just spoke about in first grade also takes place in second grade, but their reading comprehension and their vocabulary assessments are done on the Chromebook. So we did this as a, a whole grade level. Last Wednesday, we have a few kids that missed it. So we've made, we have to um, make up some time with them. We should be done in the next week or so. The fall benchmark closes November 30th. We had a later start, but I actually think it's good for us to get a later start so we could become familiar with the assessment. And it actually was recommended for the Shea with dyslexia screener to not do it for at least six to eight weeks. So you really get to know the child. So um, I just want to go through these real quick. Is there anything on here that's different? I don't think so. Um, the oral reading fluency, it's the same. Ms. Kane, just for, for a second. Uh, the six, eight weeks for the Shaywitz screener, that's because that's the teacher survey part? Correct. Oh, that you don't wanna, yeah, yeah, you don't want to do that too soon. So, you know, having that extra time that we had, I think is really good, especially this year in particular, because it's taken that much longer for our kids to get into routines, to get into groups, to really get the ball rolling. So I'm actually, I think it's ironic that we had this extra time to do this. That makes perfect sense. And I was wondering about that as you've reported before, that's taken us a little while longer to get in. So that makes sense. Thank you. Um, the, just a little bit about the reading comprehension. The reading comprehension, um, when I looked at that with the staff, it ranges from about five to seven um, passages or selections for the kids to read. And then they have three to five questions based on the reading. So kind of like MCAS, but just on a very much lighter schedule. A lot of them were factual based questions, not much inferencing or higher order thinking or higher level thinking questions. Um, and the vocabulary on the Chromebook, that was, um, it could be a word like a street is another name for, and then four choices, uh, road, school, picture. Most of them are pretty obvious. Um, it could say, you know, what does the word happy mean? And it would, it would have something, what does the word, um, it was more, these were more like the, the choices were more synonyms of what the word was, if that makes sense. Um, so that's great too. And the, the last slide is just something I, I wanted to, to add in here. So now what do we do? <laughs> what do we do? We have this data. Um, it's kind of like when we when we do our benchmark assessments, we look at the data, what do we do? We put some, we put some interventions in place. So we are working, um, uh, some of our teams and we're really looking at creating professional learning communities about the Ames web data that we have. And a lot of teachers have already jumped in and started to work with kids. Um, we will be looking at this monthly, um, evaluating the data, bringing the data to the, these meetings, um, looking at them, setting a goal to work with these kids, going back, implementing it, teaching it, taking the data, collecting it, coming back. Progress monitoring is needed, which is great with Ames Web. <coughs> Excuse me, and then reevaluate the data. Um, so we're hoping to to really work on that. I think it's it's good for us because the next question was. What do we do now? But I, I think the teachers know what to do. We just have a tool that's a little bit more targeted to give us what areas we have to work on. And I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Snow. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so this kind of brings us forward into dyslexia and special education and how does it kind of tie together? When we look at the screening, we're thinking about pre-referral. And so um, we need to think and in, in take into consideration that general education does provide evidence-based literacy instruction, as well as academic, behavioral, and social emotional learning supports to all students. General education also provides early and responsive support through MTSS um, tiered interventions. Many students who have dyslexia can and should make effective progress with general education supports. Students who need special education services to make effective progress in the general education program, timely and appropriate special education evaluation and eligibility determination is key. So that's why um, it really is exciting that we are moving forward with this. Um, it's really going to uh, create a lot more opportunity for us to identify students who are at risk sooner. You can move on to the next slide. 
So when we um, when when we refer when students are referred for special education, they're referred through three ways: either through Child Find, a referral through early intervention, or a referral by educational perso personnel and or parents or guardians. So having this dyslexia screener gives us a more robust way um, and more data to, to have um, the educational personnel to be identifying so that we can, um, so that we can actually perform full evaluations for students. Um, the considerations for assessments, we look at reading, writing, achievement, accuracy and automaticity and oral language. And then if we move forward to children who are eligible, when we're developing goals, um, for the IEP, the five areas that we really need to focus on for students who have dyslexia is phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, and also ensuring that there's um, appropriate accommodations and modifications in place for the students. Some of the components, component skills related to reading and writing achievement. So this moves us into you know, now we do have a referral. There has been students identified either at risk that we're moving forward for with a full evaluation. So the skills we wanna look at, we wanna be able to determine how the student performs on connected te text, and we wanna look at their accuracy and their automaticity. So we'd use measures of accuracy in oral reading, measures of reading comprehension, measures of written language. Um, and for automaticity, we'd be looking at measures of their written fluency with oral reading. So to determine how the student performs in, in the word level, we'd be using measures of single word reading of real words, measure of single word reading of nonsense words like Michelle was speaking about earlier, and then spelling of single words. We, for, to look at their automaticity, we'd be looking at a timed measure of single word reading and uh, of real words. And then we, we would be doing the same thing for um, nonsense words. And then we would use the measure of the rapid automatized naming. And that's really great that through the screening, we're able to um, pull that out early because that is sometimes uh, a measure that we use during an evaluation process. So our, to already have that data point, that's really great. Um, the component skills we look at related to reading and writing achievement, we, we wanna determine how the student performs on connected text. So we would use a measure of listening comprehension. We wanna determine how a student performs at the word level. And so we'd use a measure of expressive vocabulary, a measure of receptive vocabulary, because students can have different abilities uh, with regard to their expressive and receptive vocabulary skills. And then to determine how the student performs at the foundational level. So we would be just using a measure of expressive language skills and a measure of receptive language skills, how, they, how they're using language. So planning and coordinating a thorough evaluation can make the IEP process a lot more effective by providing the team with the information it needs to determine eligibility and construct a very um, effective and robust IEP. And so just to give you a little snapshot of some of the tools that we already are using to identify and to evaluate students, we have um, a lot of wonderful evaluative tools in Littleton. So some of the uh, measures that we use, we use the test of word reading efficiency, the second edition that's called the tower. Um, we use the uh, Wel Welshler individual achievement test, the fourth edition. We also use the Woodcock Johnson 4. Um, we use the CTOP, which is the Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing, the Test of Reading Comprehension, the uh, TORC, which is the fourth edition, the Gray Oral Reading Test, fifth edition, the GORD 5, which is a really great um, tool to use. And um, we also do use the Pfeiffer Assessment of Reading. And that really kind of gives us the whole, the whole circle. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Brad, go ahead. <laughs> Surprisingly. Uh, first, I want to thank you for that really thorough presentation. Um, I, I should note that this was um, to my fellow committee members. This they uh, CPAC asked um, the leadership through me to, to get this presentation. And so I really appreciate y'all being responsive and um, and explaining things so clearly. I guess my one question is, um, maybe it's to Michelle, you're talking about your, your teachers. Like they're finding time to kind of figure out what to do with this data and how to calibrate the responses. Is that, you're talking about the PLCs, is that happening professional development days? Is that happening offline? How's that, how's that work happening? So we've carved out some time during our staff meetings. Um, and it's, I, I know K and one are doing grade two is if grade two is choosing a different path, then we're going to find another way to do it. A lot of times what we do is we discuss these students at student success team meetings. Um, but this is a really 
this is a really targeted way for us to look at an intervention whole grade as opposed to one class or one student. So looking at, you know, a universal des design intervention for that whole grade level and giving them the opportunity during staff meetings to talk about it, implement it, collect the data, come back, how did it look? What else can we do in Target? So can I jump in on that for a second? Because that's the really cool part about this, right? Is that this is a screener. So we're able to kind of dipstick and, and look at all of the students. And the the, the, the student success team is, is great, but they're individually referred to that. And, uh, you know, it's a student that's struggling for reading and maybe, uh, you know, we're not sure about the why. This gives us the why pretty early on. It looks at, especially with the Shaywitz um, screener, it isolates out really specific behaviors that have correlated with students who then have been identified or have dyslexia. And it's research based. So I think that's really helpful as, as well. Well, and I agree. I think that's an exciting thing. And I know we're not there now. I look forward to hearing at the end of the year and coming years, if you think we're identifying children um, with dyslexia um, that we wouldn't have caught otherwise and that we're able to help them sooner. I, I look forward to that. We're not, we're not there yet, but um, I'm glad we're doing this. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. Any other questions before we move on? All right. Uh, thank you all for the presentation. Very informative. Okay, that's going to bring us to new business, and we're going to invite Katrina Hagberg to give an update on the public health metrics. Hi, everyone. Find my slides. All right. So let's just get going. Um, so this is that snapshot that the DPH publishes every day um, or during the work week at this point. So on a statewide level, today's um, COVID dashboard continues to be looking similar on the over like over um, head view, but cases have increased over the last two weeks. The seven day average is now around 1600 per day. Um, the test positivity is higher at 3%. The seven day average of hospitalizations has also increased in the last week, now averaging around 570 per day, and, but deaths are holding steady. So just to look at that um, cases for a little bit closer, dive in. Um, cases have been stable for weeks. So you can see that as I move my own thing. Um, week over week, we had pretty flat cases. And you can see that most weeks we'd have a Monday kind of a bump up, that's when people tended to go get tested. And then there'd be a lower flat. This is a holiday. That's why that's lower. So Tuesday was higher. This is the pattern we're used to seeing through the whole pandemic. In the last two weeks, we've had more of a flat, a plateau for each week instead of the peak. That was a little more peaky. But um, and then this is this Monday. So this Monday, there was 2800 cases that were um, confirmed on that date. And that is definitely higher than we've seen. When we look at the CDC community um, transmission rates, this is um, all of Massachusetts is a high community transmission area per the CDC's metrics, um, including Middlesex County and Middlesex County actually went up in rates and test positivity. And then when we look at um, COVID case rates by age group, um, our Age five to nine and 10 to 14 are definitely the highest, the age group of the highest rates. All age groups, however, went up this last week. If you can see that here. Um, the five to nine and the 10 to 14 actually have had a three week increase. So this is um, the last two reporting periods. There's been an increase there, a marked one. Um, so something to keep our eyes on. That's the group that just became eligible to be vaccinated. So those, hopefully this will start to trend back down when vaccines get in arms. And then just to dive into a little bit, um, that hospitalization number, like I said, just peaked, started to go up and it really started to go up over the last just couple of days. Um, so the number of hospital admissions and Massachusetts defines these as being admitted for COVID. So not just in the hospital and having to test positive. These are for COVID complications um, started to trend higher in the last few days. Um, I want to be clear, thanks to the vaccines, this is not the same kind of surge we saw last November. Our vaccines are working. We're holding pretty steady here. Um, and the number of, as the number of infections trended higher, like we just saw in the other age group one, we're going to expect hospitalizations to follow and dust to follow eventually. Those are the lagging indicators. 
Um, the have to say that the number of cases reported over the last four weeks by age group are relatively stable. There is a little bit of a jump in the 80 plus. There's a little bit of higher leap in the 50 to 59. You know, otherwise we're kind of looking at the same um, age groups that have been hospitalized. So the younger you are, the less likely you are to be hospitalized. If you are vaccinated, you're less likely to be hospitalized. So all those things are still holding true. The one thing that I do see that is of concern, and it has been of concern for the last month, is this hospital capacity. For the last few days, like weeks, it keeps ticking up just a little bit over and over. So it's at 92% of all beds and surgical, medical and surgical beds are actually currently occupied, 84% of ICU beds. And there's a number of reasons for this. People may have put off care and are now receiving care, so they're in the hospital now. Um, there are staffing shortages. The healthcare system has been... there healthcare workers are tired and are not um, necessarily working as much right now. So there are fewer beds because we don't have personnel to man them. Um, and then the other thing that I just learned this week is that a patient who is hospitalized for COVID actually stays in the bed hospital longer um, than an average patient. So a patient who's being treated for COVID may stay there in the same duration of time, they might turn that bed over three times. So they're part of this capacity issue is that it takes longer for a COVID patient to come out of the hospital. Um, they stay longer. So that impacts bed availability. So anyway, I put this here because this is a good reminder um, as we're entering these holiday seasons and multi-generational gatherings, we want to try to keep people out of the hospital. Um, so if we can keep them from being infected, they definitely won't be in the hospital. So something to just take care as we see our family, but to repeat, this is not the same surge we saw last November our vaccines are working. All right, so getting into some local data. Um, for the last two week period, which ended November 13th, Littleton had 33 cases. And that's a definite jump up from the prior two week period where we had, I think 13 cases. So Katrina, so for the two weeks we didn't meet, there was really good news. And now yes. we're meeting again. All right, thanks for nothing. All right. I, I didn't do this. <laughs> I would have chosen the other way too. But um, when we look at the two metrics that are available that DPH publishes by town, um, the last two week period, again, this is the two weeks post Halloween. This happened last year. Um, the, this is the rates per 100,000 for Littleton and also the surrounding area. And as you can see, everything trended higher. Um, Littleton happened to double. Um, but everything else is still in the same range. So we're looking at around 24 per 100,000 cases. And then test positivity, which tells us whether there's enough um, testing happening. It's the number of positive tests over the number of tests conducted. So this is not a proportion of people. This is a proportion of tests conducted. Um, the Littleton's test positivity was 2.99%. It was nice to see that during, unlike this earlier surge, we actually had a lower number of tests conducted during this last week. We actually had a higher number. So we're, we're still doing tests, which is good. That makes me feel better about that we're capture, capturing cases early. All right, and then this is the CDC community transmission rates for the last seven days. Um, again, the date at the one week ending November 13th, the state, Middlesex County, and Littleton continue to be classified as high community areas and all trended higher over the last two week period. So things are just, we're going back up. And we see this in our school data. So um, the schools have seen an increase in the number of cases over the last three weeks. So this is um, the data the week of the period of time was October 30th to um, November 5th. And then we have November 6th to the 12th. So we had four and then eight And this last week, which is updated as of today, we had 16. So we have a doubling effect going on week over week for the last three weeks. Um, so of the 16 cases reported this week, seven have been at Shaker Lane. Russell Street has had four, although I will note that Russell Street had a flurry of them the last two weeks, and they were the predominant school with cases. So that's something to keep an eye on. And um, the high school has had five. So little, the middle school, whatever's in the water at the middle school, let's just pump it to the other schools, please. That would be great. Um, I probably cursed the middle school. I'm sorry, Jason. <laughs> um, 
So what I do, so in these elementary schools, the Shaker Lane and Russell Streets, these kids just became eligible for vaccines, many, some of whom got first doses, but they're not fully vaccinated yet. And um, it's from talking to the administration that we are finding cases in the, um, the testing program, not only the weekly COVID safety checks, but also the test to stay program. So that layer of mitigation is working as intended to be an early um, detection of cases. You take them out of the classroom, you track their close contacts, you pull out kids as they become positive with test to stay. So that is working as we in as intended. Um, so really encourage everyone to sign up for that program. I'm not entirely sure what's happening at the high school. Someone else will have to fill me in because I haven't, I don't have a contact on that one. Um, but when I look at this, this high vaccination plus a lot of testing model, which our, our colleges and universities are using in our, in our state and elsewhere are really being successful at keeping COVID from spreading. So this would be something if we could increase our vaccinations and increase our weekly testing, it would be a great tool to employ for our local situation. And then it came to my attention earlier this week that people um, were not aware of the lag of the town data compared to what we're receiving from the school. So I just wanted to compare how these have looked. Um, so the school's health notification letters come out to us in nearly real, real time. As soon as the school finds out about them, does the contact tracing, then we find out about them. Um, and that creates this week to a week and a half um, gap between when we hear about the school cases and when the DPH publishes the town's case numbers. Um, so that in essence, our schools are our early warning system that something has happened or changed in the transmission patterns around town. And granted, that's not all age groups represented in our schools, but it is a group who has high exposure opportunity um, and are expected to have high exposure opportunity. So this is, this is expected that we would see it first in our schools. Um, so in the past few weeks, schools are averaging about one quarter to one third of all town cases. Um, if you, so between, for example, between October 31st and um, November 13th, there were 33 town cases that's here. We just found out about this today. Um, but we actually knew over the same two week period that there were 12 school cases. So the school cases were 36% of the town cases. Um, so when we were looking at, we now know that there's 16 cases this week. So hopefully we're not at 60 cases. <laughs> um, sorry, there's 23 cases over this two week period that the DPH will next report. So hopefully we are not at 60 cases next week for the town, but we will see. Um, so this is, I just wanna show this because I don't think we can use the town's data to make decisions about the school. The school really has the real time information um, and it's important to take early action because then we can keep the whole town's numbers down if possible. And then the meat of today is of the vaccination coverage. So unlike the last time I was here, I can now present on those five to 11s. Um, at this point in time, 76.9% of all Littleton residents of all ages are um, fully vaccinated. 13% are partially vaccinated. And there's 11% who are not, who are currently unvaccinated of which 529 are eligible. So we still have zero to four who are not eligible. Um, and that's about 5% of our population. But opening up vaccinations to the five to 11 year olds has been great. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, we had about nearly 400 um, residents in that age group vaccinated, so are now into the partially vaccinated category. Um, so 48% of our five to 11 year olds have been vaccinated in the first two weeks of eligibility. There remains 52% who will hopefully seek vaccination soon. Otherwise, these numbers really haven't changed um, for any other age group substantially. There are, we're still high across the board pretty much. Um, I do wish the 16 to 19 year old wasn't stuck at 80%, but it is what it is. Um, hopefully people will get vaccinated, but otherwise our town's doing really well. And then entering the public health um, information. So of course I just talked about vaccines. It's with vaccines available to kids five to 11, um, it's, it's great if you need to get them vaccinated, if you want to get them vaccinated, now's your time. Um, the Pfizer vaccine is available. It's a one third of the dose of that administered to all other age groups. And if you have questions about the vaccine and whether it's right for your kid, please go reach out to your um, pediatrician 
Our next town clinic will be on November 29th, which is the Monday after Thanksgiving, and they will take walk-ins is what I heard. You know, when the then, hours, I'm sorry, Katrina. I think it, I think they're expanding the hours a little bit. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm hoping, Dr. Clinch, maybe we can send out another email later um, yeah, once we talk to the administration. Yeah, we're actually, we're, we're going to with the town. Uh, I'm, I don't have verification of this, but we're wanting to start the clinic at three. So, or clinics, or uh, <laughs> rather than one, we have two. Yeah. Uh, three, to, three to eight, and then from eight to nine would be for walk-ins. Thank you. All right. And then effective today, all Massachusetts residents aged 18 and older are eligible for a COVID booster. If it has been six months after receiving the second dose of Pfizer or Moderna, or two months since the receiving a J&J single dose vaccine. You remain fully vaccinated if you got the initial series. Um, but there, you know, there's indications that vaccine, like we're having waning immunity against a more transmissible variant. So this is just one way to help bolster um, immunity. This is not evidence that the vaccines are not working. Um, COVID-19, the vaccines are working really well to prevent severe disease, hospitalization, and death, even against this Delta variant. Um, we just, this is a way to start seeing, re we're starting to see reduced protection and mild and moderate disease. And we're seeing that, especially with people who've had more time since they're um, finishing their initial series. So it, if you want a booster, now is the time to go get one um, to protect from any winter exposures. Um, eligible individuals may choose which vaccine they receive as a booster. So you, if you got an mRNA vaccine first, do you want J&J &J next? Go ahead. If you got J&J &J and want to mix it up with an MRA, that's also good. That's your choice. Um, and then if you are eligible, but you haven't gotten your first vaccine, the best thing you can do is to start um, getting vaccination. That's the best way to protect yourself against severe disease um, and severe complications and also your family from transmission. And then um, we've got Thanksgiving next week. So gathering for these holidays, I think is more important than ever um, for our social health or mental health, just reconnecting with family. Um, so as you consider making your plans for next week, try to incorporate ways to help make them safer, um, especially if they're multi-generational gatherings where you have individuals who are at higher risk for severe out outcomes if exposed. Um, again, everyone who is eligible should get vaccinated or boosted. Um, use a rapid test on the day of your gathering just to make sure no one is actively contagious while they're at your event. Um, you can improve in ventilation in your house by um, cracking windows, running a HEPA filter. People can wear masks. Um, think about how you're traveling there safely possible. And please don't attend if someone in your household is sick, has symptoms, or has um, been exposed to COVID. So um, I tend to think of these kind of social gatherings like it's my individual risk if I'm going into these settings. Um, so how is, what can I do to lower my, my risk or my family's risk? Um, which of these tools am I going to use? And then after the event, it's actually my responsibility to protect my community. So coming out of that, keeping an eye out for symptoms, even mild symptoms, and trying to do a test a few days later just to protect the community so, and from onward transmission if something had happened. That's a population risk reduction activity. So if we can do both of those, then we can really protect not only ourselves, but our community. And I think we can really safely gather with friends and family, um, especially if we're vaccinated and help protect our community coming out of it. So that is today. Thanks, Katrina. Uh, comments, questions? Hey, Katrina, thank you. Um, so I'm hoping that we could maybe start getting some metrics on case severity. Um, I don't know if these official metrics exist or if we could do the math ourselves and understand what percentage of actual cases are resulting in severe illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. I know one of the first slides you present always shows you know, the graphs that, and you did, you showed, you know, the cases, cases are up recently, hospitalizations looked up a slight bit, deaths were not up. I think it's important to focus on the metrics around case severity, um, especially because the vaccinations, like it's critical people get vaccinated. We're pushing that in town. I'm a thousand percent behind that. But even with vaccinations, there are plenty of breakthrough cases. We're seeing that more and more. We're seeing some numbers at the high school. We know our high school has the vast majority of 
of people vaccinated and there's still cases. And so with that, I think it's almost a question. It's like, well, everyone's getting vaccinated. Our town has an incredibly high rate of vaccination, but we're seeing cases go up. What does that really mean? Can we dig into those case numbers a little bit deeper and understand, um, you know, are they resulting in illness? Are they just cases that are getting caught by pool testing? And that's great. Of course, totally behind pool testing. It's amazing. But we also should understand that some of these people that are getting, that are, we're seeing positive um, cases, they're asymptomatic or incredibly low symptomatic. I think it's important to start making those distinctions and not focus so much on number of cases. We get these pings in our email, another case, another case. What does that really mean? People aren't getting oh, yeah. sick for the most part. So I, I would like to see a little bit more depth on, on that. I totally respect that. And I wish there was a data source that we could dig into locally. But I also want to point out that um, what you just described is an individual risk focus. You're looking at one person and their risk is low, but that community risk, they have connections throughout the community and that next person's risk may not be low. So I get that we are identifying people before they are symptomatic through our pool testing program, but that is the, that's the purpose of that is to catch them, get them out of the um, setting before they can transfer virus to another person who then might have a different risk um, scenario for themselves or their family. So I hear what you're saying. And I think that will continue to come out over time. We already know that people who are vaccinated have lower risk of severe disease, hospitalization, death. We know that. Um, but there is that community risk level that needs to be looked at, especially in places like a school, which has a wide range of people with different risk level, individual risk levels. There's a two part of that. Public health looks at the community. And if we keep trying to dig into only the individual, we are going to miss and actually end up spreading COVID um, to people who then have higher risk. So something, I'm gonna push back on that. Like I understand your perspective on that, but also if we keep just saying you're asymptomatic, let's just let it go. We're gonna end up in a situation where we have more hospitalizations and deaths down the road. And I respect what you're saying, but doesn't the fact that our, our community, our town has a vaccination rate of almost 80%, and that includes the people who are young, who either just, you know, just became approved last week or even aren't approved. So zero to 12 year olds, doesn't that count for something in terms of community protection? I mean, the it, does. it lowers the risk of right transmission now. by five. Like that alone just brings down the risk of transmission and the number of cases by five. Delta is that much more transmissible that it goes quickly. So the fact that we've vaccinated 80% means that we are reducing for 80% of the people, their case rate is lower by their five times lower cases than unvaccinated individuals. Can I just okay. piggyback on that real quick? Just about, I, I would love to be able to categorize the severity of cases we don't have the ability yeah. to, to do that right now. Right now, we only have the ability to really look at the clinical distinction between symptomatic and asymptomatic, which I think is an important distinction. But that's why the pool testing program and being able to do the test and stay has been like a real great game changer. Because if the students even uh, if they're, you know, we're catching those and we're in the students are asymptomatic, they're able to test and stay if they're a close contact. And then if they're vaccinated, it, it enables them to um, not be defined as a close contact. Those are really important factors that I, I think we need to make sure that that we're that we're considering. Um, because just a, a, another point to consider is that we're at, uh, almost at for number of cases, we are almost at, it's November, we're almost at the number of cases that we had for the entire school year last year. So the other piece, just to piggyback on what Lynn just said, this, this test to stay, these weekly testings are game changers. So what we already saw is we had this, let's take Shaker Lane. Six weeks ago, we had 11 cases in Shaker Lane in one week. The next week we had one. And that was because we were cutting chains of transmission by quickly identifying those things and it didn't keep spreading. <laughs> through further chains. Um, so what I'm hoping is that we now know this happened. We had three weeks kind of increase and in this big event, and then it dropped right down. So what I'm hoping is now that we are aware that we have had a three week doubling event that we can change and modify our behavior for a few weeks, take a little extra care, but let this test and stay in this pool testing program. If we can get that robust, then it will cut chains of transmission. It'll be quicker to come back down. Exponential growth, exponential decay. One other point too is the um, 
I don't even know how to define it, but there are kids that, that in, individuals that are, are testing positive for COVID and the experience is similar to a really bad cold. The difference is that we have a lot of rules and protocols that we have been given that we have to follow, that, that there's, there's not an exception to that, that we have to contact trace. We have to, we have to follow all of these steps that do put um, stress on, on, on the schools for, for sure. Um, but that's a variable that we can't change at this point. I, I guess I just have one other question. Uh, I mean, we've, we've been dealing with COVID now for close to two years. And one, one source of communication that, that really is lacking, and it's understandable because we're still learning about this virus, is the, the long, some people that are having long lasting COVID effects after they've had COVID. And I've been spending some time finding articles and reading about it. And it's something that's real, but mm -hmm. the conversations uh, around that topic have, have been minimal to this point in time. And I'm hoping as, as time goes on, we, we get a better understanding of, of what percentage of people are, are having long-term effects after having COVID. And, and the data is coming in, hopefully within the next couple of months, we'll, we'll have a better idea. And, and you know, our, our test and stay program and, and our safety check program, the more global term, is working really well. It's, it's been put to a test this year. And, and, and I can say without hesitation that, that it has helped us uh, control infection rates uh, that, that we see coming into our school. And, and we've been able to move case rates down as a result of our, our uh, safety check program. So I know last year when we, we implemented pull testing, we had negative pulls all the time and people were asking whether they were working or not. Well, rest assured, we've had positive pulls and, and that's allowed us to uh, do rapid testing right away and uh, catch any positives in that pool and uh, make sure that uh, they get the support they need and also identifying close contacts and doing further testing. So it's, it's, uh, it is a game changer. And I, I will say too, just like Kelly said, I, I mean, I would feel the same way after week after week where it was like negative pulls, negative pulls, negative pulls. You're almost like, are they turning the machine on? <laughs> is, is this is this really working? And then, but getting the positive pulls and then doing the reflex testing and seeing, okay, we had three individual, we, we had three, three positive pools and we caught three cases through a rapid that, I mean, it's just, it, that proves it. Um, you know, or having, you know, a, a positive pool and being able to catch multiple cases from that, that pool, um, that I guess the, I guess the machines are on. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Dr. Clenchy. Uh, any other comments? Justin? Yeah, I just had a couple of quick questions. Thanks, Katrina. Um, and, and I did hear you talk about case severity, and I want to acknowledge that because I had asked um, that earlier in the week, if you would kind of take a deeper dive on that. So thanks for the slides. And I want to ask about them, but I think you may have already answered one of my questions. So you said, and I agree with you wholeheartedly, the vaccines are doing an excellent job um, at preventing severe outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, my question for you was how good of a job, you know, is it a really good job or is it just a good job of preventing someone from actually getting COVID if they're vaccinated? And then are they doing a really good job of preventing it from a vaccinated person spreading it um, because I think we've all learned that well you might have the same viral load you have it for much less and the you know the load might not be active for so long so when you said five times is that are you five That's, times less likely to get it and five times less likely to spread it good question That's an excellent question and some of that is situational based so um, the rates right now for vaccinated people are five times lower than unvaccinated people. If you're not infected, you can't spread COVID. So vaccinated people will spread COVID less just because they're not as likely to be infected. Um, the other piece of that is when um, a vaccinated person is infected uh, or when anyone is infected, anyone can get infected. That's just natural. You inhale the virus, the virus ties to debit, thing, get in its cell and replicate. And Delta is really good about getting in cells quickly and to start replicating fast. Um, and our, our immune systems take some time to ramp up to do the control, to do what they need to do to rid your body of the virus. And so um, COVID gets a little head start on us, basically. But vaccinated people, their immune systems react more quickly to get to that level and they clear the virus quicker. So they are contagious for a shorter period of time compared to an unvaccinated person. Now, if you are um, 
in a household with someone who is contagious and you're sharing air in a kind of an intense setting or in any indoor setting, basically, where um, the virus concentration in the air can really get highly concentrated and you're, you're breathing it in a lot, um, anyone can get infected. So we're expecting that if, um, if you're hanging around someone and, or you're in a room where virus is the, you know, air flow is not turning over, not filtering, not cleaning as quickly, and you're sitting there for a while of time, you're breathing in air that has infected and eventually your system is just not going to be able to fight it off. So you're going to get infected. Um, that's just how all in, like that's how flu works. That's how colds work. That's how infectious diseases, especially those inhaled work. Um, so I'm not surprised that we're seeing breakthrough cases with vaccinated individuals because we are putting them in high intense settings with lots of people over long durations and it's going to happen. It's just how it is. So that's part of the reason for the boosters. The longer the time has been since your last one, consider getting one just because it will bring up your immune levels. So your, your, um, your rapid responders will get there quicker to shut down that period of time that you're contagious. Okay. Thank, thanks. Um, is it too much of a trouble? Can you bring back up that slide where you had the um, hospitalization age rates? Yeah. Because this was a new. Yeah, so no. we have been holding steady essentially, except for these last couple of days um, so like, in terms of everyone. Less. But when you look, this is the number of cases over a two week period for the last four reports. And if yeah. you look, it's been pretty stable and even continues to be stable for many of these age groups. Does mass break out um, zero to nine, 10 to 19? I'm just curious why zero to 19 is in the same category. I did that because I was trying to compare it to the case rates and I just haven't finished that analysis. Okay, because that was gonna be my next question is why isn't this done on a per hundred thousand? Because oh. um, I why was we, trying to did... do it a different way <laughs> where, okay. where I can't compare. Like it, so when you think about it, the more people who are infected, the more likely you are going to need to see cases. So what's really matters if you're infected, do you go to the hospital? And that's what I was trying to get at. But I just um, was, I ran out of time to me. Okay. Cause <laughs> the, the, this is great, but I mean, the Massachusetts has got the dashboard. They, they break it. The hospitalization is down by age. They do a great job of it. And when you look at it, you know, zero to 19 is hardly anybody. In so, this case, you get zero I to hear you. One, but it's I think this is pretty same that we're, they're pretty stable. The number of cases week over week has been stable for all age groups. So it's those numbers that you should. Yeah, yes. right. The vaccines are working. <laughs> the yeah. vaccines are working. Young people are not likely to go to the hospital. We're in agreement. It's just. I think it's even more powerful if you show it per hundred thousand. Um, but maybe we can get that next time. It's freely available on the DPH website if someone wants to look. It's totally feasible. Yep. I okay. sent it to the thoughts or questions from board members before we move on. Okay. Uh, Katrina, thanks for your presentation. Very informative. Uh, at this point, we are going to move over to PPS Director Lynn Snow, who's going to show a video on COVID safety check. I think Steve is actually going to play that video. Oh, all right, I Steve. Don't, I, don't have the, I don't have the link for it. There we go. To do 100,000 a day, maybe a capacity of 150,000 a day, we've filled in every square foot of this, of this building. How do you continue to grow in sort of how many people you're not necessarily diagnostic testing, but surveilling? In this case, if we're pooling, we're saying, how do we continue to apply those principles of frequent testing to a population and return meaningful enough results so they can manage their own communities? By doing pooling of 10 swabs in one tube, 
getting a result, returning whether that pool is positive or not. If it's negative, all the individuals in that pool are presumptively negative and can go about their sort of normal schedules. If that pool is positive, it's presumed that at least somebody in that pool is positive and that forces sort of like a reflex test, which is individually testing everybody in that pool and sort of narrowing down further who is it that's positive. The testing that we've developed here and then now it's starting to sort of grow is just an interior nasal swab collected dry so it's not put into a buffer. It's just the front of your nose, it's just a Q-tip, you know, barely inserted into your nose, swirled around four times. We do it every single day here for ourselves. It's completely non-invasive and it's super fast and easy. For us to be able to screen a quarter million students a week, maybe a half a million students a week, pooling's really the only way we can do it with the system that we have. This only works when the rate of infection is really, really low. If you're at 1% positivity rate in a, in a population, if you're sampling 100 students, that's 10 tubes. If one of them's positive, you tease that apart and you find the positive. But what if there's a 5% positive rate? All of a sudden, probably four or five of those tubes are gonna be positive or some number greater than one. And now you're gonna have to tease those apart. Eventually you get to a point where you now have to tease apart so many pools that it negates the effort to begin with. And it allows you to have a lot of people coming into a workplace and actually feel confident in it and know that you have the things in place to be able to keep transmission or infection extremely low. A full semester of demonstrating that builds a case for expanding that into, whether it's other schools, other companies, other workplaces, and obviously like public schools. I mean, that's like the number one at this point. Kelly and I just thought this video was kind of neat. I mean, we just do all of, we put the Q-tips in the tubes. Like I've never seen what happens to the Q-tips when they go into the lab. So I thought that it was, it was neat to kind of see the, the process unfold. But then I also thought it was neat when he was explaining, you know, why pool testing works and why we need to keep the rates low. Because if it, if it, it stresses the bandwidth of, of the numbers, then it makes, it, it makes pool testing um, not work as effectively. And, um, you know, when we're at that 5% positivity rate, it, there, there's, there's so many positive pools that you, you really can't keep up with it. And that really is where we are at right now with just monitoring, because when we have three positive pools, we're having to reflex test 30 students immediately the, the next morning at school. And doing that is, is wonderful because then we can immediately parse out like who are the actual positives through, through the rapid. Um, and, it's, and then we get the follow-up, the second tube with the PCR, which is a nice kind of confirmation. Uh, but it, we just thought it was a nice, a nice video to share. Thanks, Lynn. At this point, uh, we're gonna get an update on the potential data points to consider after a school reaches an 80% vaccination rate. Hey, Matt, can I just jump in real quick um, yeah. on with Lynn on that presentation? Do sure. you mind? No. So um, just because it made me think about it, I forgot to mention it during the survey questions. So all of the comments as expected did confirm that there still is some misunderstanding and some misinformation, and some education needed. Um, I don't know that we're ever going to be able to close that gap, but it did highlight the fact that some folks don't still understand it. They are against testing for all the wrong reasons. And, you know, if there was ever a way to close the gap, I think we would see participation go up because their fears would be, um, they'd be able to dismiss their fears because they don't actually technically understand what's going on. Um, I'm sure you folks saw that in the comments as well, but if we can just continue to fight the good fight, I think we'll, participation will continue to go up so yeah I, I agree and I think when we go through the slides it'll be nice to see we've we've got some nice increases too in in participation so hopefully that will continue to be the case all right good point Justin uh thanks Lynn and now we'll turn it over to Dr. Clenchy well, thanks, Chairman Hunt. Uh, if we could, Steve, if you could uh, move along to the presentation, that's just the original uh, data point slide that uh, created a few meetings ago. 
So right after the uh, video, there's another slide that I would like to look at. Thank you. So we've been, uh, Lynn and I and, and Jim Gareffi, the uh, administrator from uh, Shova uh, Regional Boards of Health, uh, actually Associated Boards of Health is the correct phrase, and, and Katrina, we've been, we've been taking a look at, at trying to identify data points, et cetera. I mean, transmission rates, uh, the biggest decision one has to make is, and we've been in, in a higher red zone uh, in our area, region for a long time. We seem to be managing, uh, I guess what the decision is, uh, if you're gonna use or entertain uh, transmission rates uh, at some time as a, a uh, data point, uh, you know, do you go with the, the red high range? Uh, COVID-19 case rates, we've, we've gone around on this, looked at lots of data, and, and I guess to put it quite simply, there isn't a, a magical number that, that makes any sense. So I'm going to recommend that we focus more on, on what's happening in the district and, and look at the number of cases in a particular school over a period of time, maybe two weeks or so, and uh, you know work, work with uh, perhaps the Board of Health and, and uh, you know, come up with something that, that would be a, a trigger point to uh, mask or, or a point that, that would indicate uh, mask flexibility. The COVID dashboard is just a resource I think that we all look at uh, just to look, make sure we know what's going on in the state. The uh, safety check program participation rates, as, as Lynn had, has alluded to, ha has actually increased by around 10% since October when we, we did the data analysis. So that's a good sign. But you know, uh, when we looked at, at analyzing why that's happening, uh, most of those increases were due to uh, close contacts uh, that were asymptomatic and uh, could stay and not have to quarantine if they participated in test and stay. So that, that really seems to be the driver for the uh, increase in percentages. Uh, I don't have, and an, there, there is no statistical data out there that, that we can find, I don't think it exists, that, that would give you that magic percent. And, and I think districts that are looking at this as a data point are just picking a number that, that they feel good about. So we still need to think about that one. As, as I mentioned before, we, we firmly believe that, that uh, we'd like everybody to participate in our safety check program because there are breakthrough cases. Uh, DESE still hasn't uh, changed their stance on this and, and feel that uh, uh, unvaccinated people could uh, benefit more. So uh, we, I don't really don't have a, a suggestion for percentages. I think that's something we need to, to continue to talk about. The, the bottom points, uh, Again, what, what's happened with with the uh, protocols that we're expected to use in school districts, uh, the minute we, we have a concern about the uh, number of cases in a school, a potential school cluster, uh, whether we think there's in-school transmission, we consult with DESE. And, and uh, to be quite transparent, they're driving the train. And they're driving the train because they – determine whether or not uh, we can quarantine a class or, or close a, a school for a day or two or a week. Uh, and we really can't do that unless they, they give, give their go ahead because we have to meet our time on learning requirements. And if we, we close a classroom or close a school without uh, the consent of DESE, we would have to make that time up. And, and some people would say, well, maybe you could make it up by a snow days, but that's not the way it works. We would end up paying uh, the cost of uh, uh, a system operation for each day that we did that. So again, it, reality is uh, DESE is, is, is giving us guidance, every district guidance, and, and we need to work within that framework. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this tonight. Uh, you know, I've had an opportunity to talk with some Board of Health members as well. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I really feel that, that with what we're doing in our schools, we, we have a pretty good handle on what's happening. And we've been very, very successful at bringing uh, the number of COVID cases down when they start to increase. So I'm very pleased at our mitigation strategies. 
I don't have an answer for, for why our middle school is lower than, than uh, our other schools in terms of case rates. Uh, our mitigation strategies are the same. So there's something happening outside of school, perhaps, that uh, is, is driving uh, COVID cases that, that are coming into our school. But it is quite interesting that we have one school that is so much lower than the other three. And I certainly uh, entertain any questions at this time, if, if you have any about this particular slide. Uh, could what, Kelly, could one reason be that the, if you look at the slide that's up right now, the, the middle school has a lower percentage of participation in the pool testing than the other schools and also a lower case rate? Is that just a coincidence? Who knows? But I mean, that could be one reason. Okay. Asymptomatic cases are not being caught because fewer kids are in the pool testing program in the middle school. I mean, that's, that's a good point. You know, I, we, and again, we, we're, we're hoping we're, the information that we're getting from the schools, we're, we're not missing anything. And, and the only reason I say that is if people aren't taking part in the test and safe program, we don't, we don't know what's happening with that group. But we haven't had that many asymptomatic students. Uh, most of our asymptomatic students have, have been in K2, in the K2 schools. So I, I don't know, that, that could, be, could be a factor. It's just, it's just kind of interesting that, 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 that the middle school remains really low. And, and that's a good thing. Hopefully our other schools will, will follow the same, same trend throughout time. I do, I do think it's a, a combination of factors, though, too, Jen. I think, I think you're right. I think that's one of the factors. I think if I just look anecdotally across the schools, it's, there's probably some good distancing there where developmentally when the students are younger, it's harder. And then when they're in high school, there might be more, they might be more actively not distancing. <laughs> um, so I think that that might also factor into it a little bit, too. I have a question. I, I don't think we have any um, statistical or scientific way to actually calculate the in-school transmission rate. Is that true? Well, we, when we consult with uh, our, the Board of Health uh, administrator and, and their staff and, and DESE, they, they uh, have a very thorough discussion with us and, and really what they're trying to ascertain if we have a number of cases in one classroom is there an in-school transmission? And, and we really haven't had a conclusive uh, case of that. I mean, we, we came really close with, with the Shaker Lane situation, but nobody, nobody that we dealt with labeled that as, as an in-school transmission. So it's, 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 it's not easy because there's so many variables. Out right, there. right. Yeah, it's impossible to, to just isolate in-school transmission as the culprit. I get that. I just want to, the reason I'm, bring it up is because in the survey results, that question five, where people were required to choose at least one uh, additional data point to, to rely on, uh, the most commonly selected was the in-school transmission rate. Mm -hmm. And we can't calculate that. I think that's, that's just interesting. It's kind of problematic because I mean, there were follow, there were, you know, second and third runner ups that, that we maybe do have a better hold, handle on, but I just, you know, I think people, it, the survey indicates that people really care the most about knowing whether COVID is being transmitted within the school. And this gets to, to me to, to mask, masking and mask flexibility. If, if, let's just say that we were able to calculate whether transmission were happening inside the schools, and we found that it's not, it's extremely rare that a kid is giving another kid or, or staff member COVID in the school, but rather people are contracting it out in the real world, you know, outside of school, we might feel a little bit better about mask flexibility for vaccinated students per, per DESI in buildings that are 80% or more, right? So I think that's a really important metric to keep pushing on under uh, getting a better understanding, a, be a better understanding of, because if it's not being transmitted within the school, then we might all feel a little more confident letting the vaccinated folks have mass flexibility. Can I, can I mention one thing about that? Because um, I think that that's a good point too. I, I do, and I should have maybe mentioned that, that before, when we're talking about our, our percentage of participation in the COVID safety check program, 
um, there's actually t- like two percentages that we need to be looking at, especially if we're going to be considering mask, mask flexibility. There's the percentage of consent, which is what we use to determine that number. But we do need to start looking at the number of students who uh, samples that we're actually collecting against the number of consent. Because what we have found is that there's um, the high at the high school, there are students who are not um, are not submitting their sample. And because it's a different a different collection, and so looking at that as as well, I think we need to make sure that that's weighing in there too. So we may have um, fifty seven point six percent of students have consented, but are they submitting are a hundred percent, or is there a high percentage of that fifty seven percent that are actually submitting their sample when we're collecting the when we're collecting the samples each week? And I think that's a a good point, and I just. Uh... I don't know if there's any way just to kind of remind the high school students throughout the day, because I know I've had a talk with my son who's has forgotten on Monday to go down and get his test. Uh, he's like, oh, I just I didn't realize I was supposed to go down during lunch to get my test. Um, so maybe administration could possibly just send some reminders out during the day for kids to get go and get tested. That'd be great. I do think I think we need to we do need to encourage that and give reminders and, and look at the, the structure of that because the high school is a little bit different the way we do the collection too. It's not a it's not a cart um, where it's like we're bringing it to them. They're having to come to us. So I think that that's something that we'll be looking at too to see if we need to um, make any adjustments there to, to help make it easier for the students because it is it is tough for kids to have to leave their lunch time. You know that's two or th- two or three minutes of of social time that they have with their friends that some may not be willing to, you know, give up those couple minutes. Well, and that's where um, I also have access to high schooler who tells me that, you know, people forgot or, you know, um, I'm wondering, we just had a presentation last time about flex block um, 35 minutes early in the day when people might um, have a little more free time. That's not necessarily social time at lunch or, or eating time. Um, I wonder if, cause what you're telling me, it seems to be Lynn is that, we have 57.6% who say they are willing to and have consented to participate, but the, the actual number of people participating is, is either lower. It's lower. Or lower. Yeah. Um, Probably so, in like the 40 to 50%. We did a two week sample. So we're going to do another two week sample. And then, you know, we'll, we'll have John and Keith do all call reminders and see if we can get that percentage up. And then if, if it's state, if it's not increasing, then maybe we need to look at doing a different a, a different time for the collection to make to to make the response effort for the students lower. Well, I think that you know I would encourage y'all to make that a you obviously are a top priority because as Jen's saying, you know we want people want accurate information. Um, you know I was frankly I was really encouraged by the fifty seven point six percent. If you're telling me it's it's lower than that um, isn't then that number is not quite as encouraging. It certainly is a, a focus, Brad. Uh, uh, I've had a number of conversations with Dr. Harrington. We're monitoring it from, from a, a central office lens as well. We want to make sure what we're doing is, is effective, and it it's not, doesn't take any time to, to give reminders during the day on Monday that uh, today is the uh, safety check program, et cetera. So if we don't see the improvement that we, we want, we're going to give some recommendations with high school to, to get, get the, uh, those numbers up. So, Well, and again, one thing that came clear in the survey data, which, um, the, the, again, maybe the comments are more, more valuable than some of the actual numbers, is that there are people out there who, who think, well, look, you're not going to use this anyway. Why should I bother? If it becomes clear that this is going to be a factor that um, influences, um, you know, the, the masking policy, then maybe that will incentivize some of them to participate um, more actively. For sure. Yeah. And, that, and I think that's one thing we have to consider when we're, we're uh, deciding that on the data points that we're going to use. So thank you for that. Uh, Jen, I wanted to go back to, to our discussion before we, we, we move on. I can make a, a comment uh, from the involvement that I have with, with every positive case that happens in the district in, in terms of conversation specific to trying to figure out uh, where the source was. And uh, I can say that in most cases, we, we identify pretty closely where that source was and it wasn't in our schools. So I, I hope that's comforting uh, to the people that are listening and, and, and the school committee. Uh, we, 
surprisingly enough, the, the contact, I'm not surprised, but our contact tracing is, is so thorough. We get a pretty good, pretty good picture of what's happening out there and, and you know, beyond our schools. And, and I know uh, Jim Graffy from uh, the Board of Health has, has made similar comments uh, at Board of Health meetings as well. That's good to know, Kelly. So what you're saying is that from the anecdotally, from what you've witnessed diving into these cases individually, you're not seeing a strong case for in-school spread happening. That's correct. Yes. Okay. I think that's important for people to hear. I mean, real data would be better to even bolster that, but, you know, I think if, if, if that's the case, if that's real, you know, real, real data, data, data driven information, I, I just think it's a game changer. I think we still need to protect our, our students and our staff, but if it's, if things aren't, if this isn't spreading inside the schools, I think then that might help people feel a little more comfortable over time with, you yes, know, yes. moving back toward a, a sense of normalcy. I mean, to use an analogy, uh, uh, I mean, cells have permeable membranes and, and uh, it doesn't matter what we do in schools as, as, in terms of using mitigation strategies. Uh, COVID is, is going to get through and it's a matter of catching it right away and containing it and, and making sure it, it, it doesn't spread anymore. And I think we've been very successful at that. Uh, and again, we don't have any control of what happens outside of schools and, and, and people need to, to live their lives as well. And, and it's, that, it's that delicate balance that we, we constantly talk about here, but we feel really good that, that, from what we've done and uh, to this point in time this year is that we're, we're really, we've done an excellent job of, of keeping in school spread from happening. Um, can I just jump in on this? Cause this is a, a conversation yeah. that we haven't had before. And I think this is extremely powerful. So earlier tonight, there was a slide that, you know, we've got 20 cases in the school this week and we hope that we're not going to see 60 cases in the community when the data comes out next week. And I, I do think that there's some thought process within the community that the school is actually like a breeding ground for COVID and, you know, that there's a case and then it spreads and then all these kids go back to their house and boom, it's out of control. And what I'm hearing you say, Kelly, is if everyone would just come to school, we would catch this stuff and we could really reduce the numbers. Like this is where we're stopping COVID. So the cases come in. We catch it, we identify it, and we're not sending those kids back out. There's a number of examples just recently of um, folks that have either, um, you know, done test and stay and popped positive, and then they've eliminated activities, or they got caught in pool testing, and again, they eliminated uh, possible threat. So this is this is a powerful conversation here that what the school, and you guys are doing a bang up job with this, and I can't thank you enough because you're helping the community. You're not hurting the community. You're helping in a big way. And then I just want to focus on the high school real quick because that's kind of where the attention is. So over the past six weeks, going from six weeks ago to this week, our cases are 210025. And what you're telling me is that none of those cases are really connected. So um, it's not a big number of cases, you know, yeah, it went from two to five, but it wasn't like the two kids gave it to the five and the five kids are going to give it to 15. And you no, know, you caught the cases. It's a highly vaccinated population. Um, I think it's just important to reiterate that the numbers in the high school among that population are low. I do think it's important that if we're going to report 57% of our students are participating in in the, in the uh, COVID safety check program, we probably want to report the actual tests conducted and not just enrollments. And let's put a, the coffee cart next to the nasal swab stand. Let's put, you know, Skittles or Snickers or like, let's incentivize the students to stop by and, and do it. And from the survey results, I can tell you, people said it's during my lunch. I don't want to go. So, you know, I gave that survey a, a hard time because the responses were bad, but the comments were gold. Um, there's got to be a better way where we can drive participation. But uh, to Jen's point, if in-school transmission is the most important thing to the community and we don't really have any evidence of in-school transmission. I just want to uh, jump in there. It's, it's not that we don't have any. There are, sorry, there are some that we're very few. Connected. There are some that aren't. And in it's the high hard school? for us to really know. In the high school? There are definitely some that are that that we can't say are unconnected. Okay, and I would just 
I would say, I wonder if it was within the confines of the building, you know, maybe it was on a sports team that's going to happen anyways. Um, but anyways, you know, it probably might've happened outside of the confines right. of the yep. walls of the school. Totally. So, okay. Right. Thank yeah. you. That's the context. Justin is, uh, uh, household spread, for example, uh, as a result of siblings, uh, one sibling getting COVID, et cetera, uh, activities outside of school where they're unmasked and close, close together. But we, we've been pretty successful at, at identifying those kinds of situations. Any other questions before we move on? Not seeing no one from the board. Okay. I can't see the, the panel, so I'm just speak up if anyone has a question. Okay. Why don't we just finish the, the last two slides and then we'll be ready to, to uh, entertain more questions from uh, the school committee or you know, like a plan. We, we entertain questions from the public. But uh, Lynn prepared this slide just to show you how our, our uh, safety check participation rates have, have changed from, from month to month. And you do see definite increases as, as we continue to go on. And well, Kelly, is it, I'm sorry to interrupt. Is it safe to say at um, Shaker Lane, Russell, and maybe even the middle school where, as Lynn said, the tests are brought to the students that the participation rate is closer to the actual Submission rate? Yes. Okay, yep. thank you. Those numbers are much better. I really appreciate everybody's work in getting those. I like seeing those. Yeah, you know, if you don't go back and trace the history, you sometimes get a very a very uh, different impression of what's happening. So I, I think this is a pretty powerful slide. So the next slide is, is just a one you've all been waiting for. And uh, we, we do have a confirmation of uh, high school vaccination rate. Uh, percentage vaccination rate is over 80%. It's, at this time, it's 82.6%. And that's uh, all we have for uh, information to, to present this evening. Okay. Thoughts? Can, yeah, go ahead. Someone? Um, I just... Thank you for all of the work and all of the presentations. It's really, um, the information is great. And getting that last number was great. I also, I'm one of those high school parents whose child won't go and get tested. Um, every Monday I say to him, hey, did you go? Nope, I stood in line too long. No, I this. I like the so, idea of leaving, of having snacks though at the table. We'll, we'll yes, definitely try that. Yeah, free, free snacks. Bag of chips might entice him to yeah. get there. <laughs> um, and every Monday morning I say, you gotta go. And he's like, if I get out of line fast enough. Anyway, um, I can I make a motion right now to for Matt, Chairman Hunt, you're muted. Can't hear you. Sorry, working on multiple screens. Um, I w why don't we... You want other we, people to talk? We, okay. No, I want to yep. get an update on the high school vaccination rates. Um, we got it. It was just really brief. <laughs> I think we should take a beat and, and really focus on that because it was just a slide and nobody even said yeah. the words out loud. Right. It was so very, the slide was 82.6%. Yeah, that's huge. That's, that's Kelly said, what we've all been waiting for. Let's take a moment right. and focus on that. 82.6% at the high school. That's incredible. But I do, yeah, I want to have a little bit of conversation on that. Conversation about that. I think that's we, great. I'm So I just have one question too about that slide. You, it, three, we had to find out that 376 children were vaccinated through our MIAIS, <laughs> MIIS website. That's correct. Yes, and so I think that's a very important had to, point. Our nurses had to do that. <laughs> yes. On top of everything else they're doing. Okay, I wish parents would have sent in their vaccination cards so that the nurses and who whatever administration had to work on that didn't have to find 376 vaccination cards it's a little disappointing actually, in the town 
<laughs> well, I, I will, I will jump in it, it. They actually, the MIS platform did a really nice thing and created a mechanism for schools to be able to do a, C, a CSV upload. And so oh, it, nice. we didn't, the, so it the, wasn't that hard. It was, okay. it was a little time consuming, but right after the last meeting, there was a webinar and there was uh, a way for us to upload all of the students information at one, uh, upload it and then download it and then get those numbers. That's oh good. I'm glad that the, that it wasn't as difficult as we thought it was going to be to get those numbers. That's nice to hear. But the point being is I think, you know, as you're alluding Timlin, we probably have had these numbers for quite some time, um, but we, yes. you know, the fact that parents were not giving us that information, uh, you know, it may have put us a little bit behind. And so, you know, it's always helpful when we get full cooperation from families. Um, yes, I, I just I feel like putting that we the, our nurses are stressed out and stretch to their limits with the work that they have to do right now, that adding something else onto them because they're the only ones that can access that site. If I'm remember correctly, yeah, that they were the only ones allowed to. Yeah. So yeah. to put more on their plate, I'm glad to hear that it wasn't as much as we thought it was going to be. But that number is just, I, I think that's a, just amazing. I work in a district where we're nowhere near that number. Um, so it says a lot for Littleton and, you know, what they've done, how serious we are about vaccination. And uh, I think you know, it's, it's going to just help us keep our schools safe as we learn to live through the pandemic. Uh, cause you know, COVID is not going anywhere. It's, it's going to be here with us and we're going to have to learn to navigate. Brad. Yeah. I just want to ask a clarifying question cause that's the 82.6%, but I saw that we, only did the MIA, MIIS kind of data search for students and not for faculty. Is it safe to assume then that if, that the 82.6 is the lowest possible number and it may actually be higher if there are faculty members who did not, faculty and staff, I'm sorry, who um, just neglected to turn in their, their cards? It might be a little higher. We Slightly. We made a con not much. We made a conscious decision uh, to not use MIIS uh, uh, because we don't collect health data on staff. So oh, I, I support that decision. I just wanted to. This is as low as the number possibly could be. There's a chance it's a tick or two higher. There were 83, 84, 85 percent. Um, right. I have another cl clarifying question. So yeah, Brad, thanks for establishing that 82.6 is the floor. Um, the way that I read this was of the, all the high school students, 376 are in fact vaccinated. Of the 376, we actually have proof. They themselves submitted proof of 285. Some of that proof may have been in the form of a form and an MIAS lookup. Some may have actually just walked a copy of the card in. So um, if every, if all 285 had walked a copy of the card and you only would have had to look in the database for the Delta, um, if I understand this correctly, but regardless, not Delta, the floor video Justin, let's not use Delta. Come on, man. <laughs> safe word. Well, um, it's Delta. It's not COVID humor. Yes. There was, um, there was no way, there was no way for us to just upload the, the, that would have been very time consuming for us to just, to, to curate the list of the ones that we did not have the proof for to see of that, we that would have been time consuming. It was easier to just get our just whole- Just look number. everybody up? It yeah. Was, oh, that's, a, that's fascinating. Because yeah. we were like thinking that this was gonna be such a difficult task. So I'm glad to hear that that yep. went smoothly. Um, well, Justin, the, the, Lynn, you're, you're, you're being very generous in, in your comments. Uh, it wasn't as easy as, as loading the field you wanted and all of a sudden it appeared in front of you they that some data was kicked out and we had to go back in or I, there were errors tech had to get involved tech had to generate a csv file and make sure that it was all formatted correctly so what it was time consuming but it was less than time consuming than having to keystroke each individual student's name and date of birth into the mias all right okay uh now any other comments for Timlin? You wanted to make a motion. 
I did. I feel that um, we should get the ball rolling with Desi and getting our waiver. So I'm not saying that we're going to use it anytime soon. Not saying that, but I think we, sh I feel, and I'm not sure how everyone else feels, but I would like to make a motion that we ask um, Superintendent Clenchy to apply for the waiver with Desi for the mask um, mandate waiver. For the high school? For the high school. I'll second that motion. Okay. Uh, any discussion before we move on to a vote? All right. Motion made and seconded. Uh, this is a roll call vote. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. Brad? Brad Austin, yes. Jen? Jen Gold, yes. Timlin? Timlin Rassius, yes. Matt Hunt votes yes as well. Okay. Moving on, that is the last item on our agenda. Any other thoughts on this before we... I, I mean, I, I have um, like a, maybe a subsequent motion or a motion for discussion. I don't know if you want to take, maybe do we have a hand up for public comment? Do you yeah. want to? I see Diane Whirling. I don't know if, what you want to do. Um, oh, that's I would fine. like the opportunity to. You can do public input if anyone wants to. Okay. Yeah. Diane Whirling, please state your name, your street, and your question, please. Hi, I'm Diane Whirling. I live at Nine Valley Drive, Littleton. I just wanted to say how thankful I am for the option to have pool testing. I have three kids in the school and my youngest just Monday tested positive in pool testing. He is completely asymptomatic and we would not know that he had any problems, you know, this week at all if we did not have the testing. So I would have sent him to play dates. I would have sent him to hockey. You know, the rest of us would have done our regular things, but I'm so thankful for this program in town that he can, you know, now quarantine and not infect, you know, my mom at Thanksgiving and other things. So I think it's great. And I think everyone needs to sign up for it. Uh, thanks, Diane. Thank you so much, Diane. That's a powerful statement. I know so we saw a lot of comments on the survey that said um, didn't see the need to sign up. And that's just one reason right there why it is so important to get, get your kids part of the testing program. Yes. And I will also say, Timlin, to agree with you, my oldest daughter in the high school who is signed up for it, she said that the line was way too long and she got reprimanded <laughs> pretty deeply on Monday for that. But um Yes, I really appreciate it. And I work in the school and I appreciate it in my school. And I think you guys are doing a great job. Thanks, I will Diane. say, D Diane, too, and Timlin and, and other people that have high school students, um, the pool testing team, they are trying to onboard more staff, too, um, so that the line's not so long. But if we can get more staff and snacks, I, I think that might be helpful. All right. Uh, I think that's all we have for hands raised at this time. Uh, Justin, did you want? Um, yeah, I just want to address the fact that, um, you know, we've achieved the vaccination rate. We heard a lot tonight from um, the administration team about the massive efforts that are being undertaken with pool testing and test and stay. And, you know, when I look at the high school numbers more closely, um, I know we got a lot of letters this week, but um, the high school numbers with that vaccination population is, Pretty good. And I just want to address the fact that we don't have the ability to do anything <laughs> with a waiver because we're in Littleton and we've got a townwide mandate. Um, so I would like to make a motion to address that issue. Um, and if it receives a second, we can discuss it. But um, I move that Littleton Public Schools request a mass exemption from the Littleton Board of Health for Littleton High School. The purpose of the exemption would be to conduct a trial period of optional masking for individuals who have submitted proof of full, app, full vaccination status at the high school. The trial would run December 6th through the 20th, uh, December 23rd. 
At the conclusion of the trial, masks would again be required for all individuals upon the return from winter break, which would be January 3rd, until the school committee has had a chance to review the results of the trial, which would take place at a special school committee meeting on January 5th, um, 2022, which is a Wednesday. I second the motion. Okay. Um, motion made and seconded. I think this will have to, we'll open this up for some conversation. I do want to just remind that this, of course, would be contingent on approval from the Board of Health. Uh, I know you threw in some dates there, but uh, so if we were to pass this motion, it would then have to go to the Board of Health to be approved by them. Correct. The clarification point there is this motion is to actually ask the Board of Health for an exemption and their first question might be, what would you do with it? And the motion attempts to answer that question with saying, we're gonna do a three week trial, we're gonna do it on this day and this is how it's gonna work. Um, and the reason why I made this motion is it's similar to, it's nearly identical to the Hopkinton model. Um, Desi's reached back out to Hopkinton. I watched another Hopkinton school committee meeting, if you can believe it. Um, Desi reached out to Hopkinton and said, we'd like the idea of a trial. We're actually recommending that am among other districts that have applied for the waiver. So um, I think the timing's good. I think it's the right strategy. Again, we're only talking about the high school. We're talking about 82.6% vaccinated and only the opportunity to remove masks for those that are fully vaccinated and have submitted proof of vaccination. Okay. I'll open it up for comment. Thoughts on, uh, thoughts on this from board members? Trying to mute myself. Um, I I actually like that idea. I like the idea of a trial run in between the Thanksgiving Christmas break because it'll give us some. It might give us some uptick numbers because of the holiday, but then again, we'll see how the spread is in the school if they're unmasked. Um, my only question is, I have seen um, other districts that have applied for the waiver and gotten it are also getting parental um like parent signatures saying that their child can be unmasked because there might be some parents out there that have vaccinated children that don't want their child to be unmasked in school so i think maybe we should add that on uh, yep you bring up a really good point someone thank you um i i wasn't sure if that would be left up to the administration in terms of like an implementation strategy but the way in which this is being conducted is you need to bring in documentation so that it doesn't become a, hey, you're vaccinated, I'm unvaccinated. It's, hey, you sent in your documentation. I didn't send in my documentation. And I do think that part of the documentation needs to be a parental consent because I do think that people have concerns about, in fact, people submitted documentation to us not knowing what we were going to do with it. Um, so we probably should ask for parental consent. And if that needs to become part of the motion, we can amend it, or if we just want to leave it up to the administration, but yes, Tim, I'm a hundred percent agreement. I would agree with that too. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, Dr. Clenchy, should this motion pass, would do you think that that could be, uh, just handled by administration and their purview or do you? Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. I, and I, I like that idea. I mean, it, I, we, we want to make sure that, that our parents uh, are familiar or, or, or know uh, whether their students are masking or not. Okay. Uh, are there comments or before we move to a vote? Brad? Yeah, I, um, I like the idea of, of a trial period. I am much more comfortable with doing this in mid January for a variety of reasons. Um, Justin, I get what you're saying entirely. Um, but I do know is that by mid January, um, whether it's January 15th, whether it's the time period you're saying after the, the holidays, um, everyone who wants to be vaxxed and boosted will have time to do that. All of the, the five through 12 year olds who are not in the high school, but are listen, I'll, in, Next door, I've got a, a little 10 year old who's kin to a, a high schooler. Um, they'll have the opportunity to be vax boosted and have the waiting room. Um, the town vax rate will be above 80% by then. We'd have time to handle the logistics. We um, After 
doing this between Thanksgiving and Christmas doesn't make as much sense to me as doing it. We've waited this long to do it in the, the time after any potential surge will happen, will have happened. Um, I, I, I think by mid January, we're going to be in our new world where everybody wants to be and is able to be vaxxed will be vaxxed. Everybody who's able to be boosted will be boosted. The five through 12 year olds will be there. Um, I, 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 we come this far. I don't want to rush it um, because let's be honest, when we're talking about our, there's no in-school transmission or very little in-school transmission, that's with everybody masked, um, right? And if we're going to um, remove that mitigation strategy, as town cases are going up, doubling over the last three weeks, um, as we go into Thanksgiving, as people are traveling, um, look, I, I'm ready to, to, to do this. I'm going to vote against this motion um, if, it's, if it's in December. Um, so th those are my thoughts. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, Brad. Um, I'm, you know, I'm ready. Um, you're not ready. That's okay. Um, I'm looking at the sort of the severe outcome for that zero to 19. Um, we, this is something that collectively the school committee kind of thought we were going to do anyways. And in, in August, you know, now all the better. The, uh, the vaccination has started for the five to 11 year olds. Um, my concern is if we wait, honestly, my concern is if we wait till mid January, we're going to say, well, not enough of them are vaccinated. And then we're going to wait a little longer. And then we're going to say, well, now the seniors need another boost. Like, it's just, we're always going to be waiting for it to get better. And I, I keep using this analogy. You know, I thought we were in a tunnel and there was light at the end of it, but I think we're in a hole. And the only way to get out of this is to back out of it. So I, I'm no longer kind of willing to just extend the timeline. I think if we are above 80% and we look at the high school and these guys are doing a great job, I think the time is now. So. I would say, you know, I think you both raise valid points. There's, I think, pros and cons to both arguments. I think having that two and a half week period before Christmas break um, gives us a nice sample size. And I think you know, to give us an idea of what's going to happen if, if this goes on. And then we would come back after the holidays, mask up until we, uh, we are able to meet on that if we could do a special meeting on that Wednesday for a single item meeting uh, and discuss it. Um, I think the reason I, I feel a little comfortable with this is that, you know, we're going to send this to the board of health. Um, what I see this is as we're asking for a trial period, if the board of health wants to send it back and say January 15th, that's up to them, but we're putting out a date and that's okay. Um, so, that's my feeling on it. Any other, Dr. Clenchy, any thoughts? Uh, just to maybe help the conversation along a bit. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that if the Board of Health would grant a waiver to us, there, there would be some conditions to that waiver in terms of data points that, that would have to be met. So I, I don't want people to think that there, there wouldn't be any expectations before we could, we could go into this trial period. I, I, I just don't see the Board of Health doing that. So, and, and again, I, I, I would venture to guess it would, some of it would, would have to do with the uh, number of COVID cases at the high school uh, pre, uh, pre going into the trial and then some type of measurement or, or scaling to determine uh, whether uh, we were making progress in the right direction during that trial period. So I, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not as concerned about not having some, some uh, data points that, that would be part of the process. And I think that makes me feel a little, a little more comfortable with, with moving ahead with, with the waiver and, and, and the dates that are shown. Any other more thoughts or comments from 
board members before we move to a vote? Do we want, it's a pretty big step. Do we want to see if there are any hands raised? I haven't checked among participants um, or- no, we, we can do that. We can take public comment. Okay. Oops, sorry. Matthew Ridge, please state your name, your street and your question, please. Matthew Ridge. Sorry, I wasn't letting me unmute. Uh, Matthew Ridge, 325 Great Road. Uh, I have a concern here. Um, a little while back, we were told that people who are vaccinated cannot spread the disease or the, uh, the coronavirus. CDC says it on their website that people who are fully vaccinated can spread it if they have COVID. doesn't matter which variant. It says it. So I wish people would, if you want to talk about spreading the truth and not lies or misinformation, this would be great if we start there. Uh, secondly, this in, uh, entire scenario, I'm sorry, but we are, as people have said here, we are never going to get rid of COVID by the looks of it. It's going to be with us for the rest of our, our lives, unless it naturally just disappears like several diseases and viruses that we've had in the past, like swine flu. Um, the big issue I have here is that we are going to be putting our system in the hands of somebody else. Uh, and we need, we, we've hit the 80%. We need to start realizing that since the majority of the people are, who are not getting contagious, who are actually getting the virus is not in the school system, then we need to realize that the chance of it spreading is not at the school, but at home. And that's where the education needs to start happening, not at the school. Thirdly and finally for me, I want to make it perfectly clear that a lot of us don't, it's not that we don't want to get our kids vaccinated or we don't want to get vaccinated. We do want to get vaccinated. But the thing is, is that this is still an, an emergency situation only. And we are being coerced into going to get a vaccination. The CDC, OSHA, and all the others have dictated this vaccine is for emergency purposes only. Unless you're going to be putting this under a state of emergency or the town of emergency, because I don't think we are in a state of emergency anymore. We need to, we need to give people the choice instead of saying, carrot, here's a carrot. If you don't do it, there's the stick. You need to stop. It's either going to happen or it's not. Give the people their choice. Let them make it. Don't punish them. It, if we hit the numbers, let the people wear masks or not wear masks. Those who want to wear masks, let them. Those who don't, don't. Don't make it punishment. And that's all I'm going to say is because that's what it feels like right now is that we're going to go here. We're going to do this. And we're just going to see how it flies. If it goes the bad way, then if the numbers go up, but we don't know if it's in the school or not, we're going to punish the school kids again. If it's happening in the classrooms, fine. Then we'll, we'll deal with it then. If it's happening at the houses, then we need to make sure it's not, we are not punishing our children because that's what it feels like right now. We are punishing our All children. Right. Thank you. I'm going to stop happening. you there, Matthew. Thank you. I'm going to stop you there. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not actually not... 100% sure some of his comments were accurate as far as um, the Moderna and I think Pfizer now has a full, uh, is fully, uh, it's no longer a, just a safety measure that has full FDA approval. And also, Matt, I just wanted to respond. Um, I don't think any of us have, have said, or we're certainly not operating the assumption that vaccinated people cannot shed the virus. We had a lot of questions about exactly how often that happened tonight 
we know that's the case. Um, the other thing is, is I want to clarify uh, related to the motion, um, the decision, the DESE mandate through January 15th would still, if I understand correctly, require unvaccinated people um, to wear masks, Correct. Uh, regardless of what we do. So that's not us as a group making decisions, that's us adhering to, to state, um, state law. Yep. Okay. Solomon Marini. Well, I'm going to go with Mike Zeldin. Okay. So, go with Mike. Yeah. We brought it. sorry. Board of health member. Sorry. Mike Zeldin. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. I hope you can. Uh, yes. I've successfully unmuted. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> good evening. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, thank you for all your comments. I'm really impressed by the level of concern and interest, by the way, that your, that your survey revealed. Those are great responses, believe it or not. It means that people are really thinking, have been thinking about this. I can't speak for the conclusion or the direction that the Board of Health will, will take on your waiver, which we've been preparing for for some time. This is not you know, a new, a new subject. Uh, let me just say that one of the one of the topics that we've been looking very hard at is the one that you were discussing in some detail tonight, and that is the actual amount of real participation in testing. Uh, we've been uh, we've been very concerned about that in the town as well. Where, very frankly, it's frustrating not only at the town level but at the state and federal level. So let let me just say that that if you can feel from me any sort of encouragement or incentive to do what you can to increase the level of participation direct in testing. Okay, you will come a long way to achieve many of the objectives that many of you, and frankly, the Board of Health would like to achieve along with other people in town, and that is put as much of this pandemic behind us as possible. But we have to be realistic and be able to as know where we're going. And testing provides that view. And I have to say, the other point I want to correct is that the Board of Health and no one I've ever spoken to who understands public health or this virus has ever indicated that the school is a source by definition of infection for the town, nor am I suggesting that the town is the sole source of infections that may or may not appear in the schools. There is no dome. <laughs> over Littleton. When the students come out of the school and out of the incredible mitigation efforts put on by the administration under your, with your direction and help, they, they basically leave a very special environment and they go out, shall we say, into a wilder area and then come back in. So I am not, there's been never any suggestion that I've ever heard or any assumption that the, as it were, that the spread is dominant in one one place or another, we're all part of the same community. The virus loves us all equally. And by the way, it does not pay much attention to our opinion polls. Uh, I can only encourage you just for your... Okay, I, I'm, a, I'm a molecular biologist by trade, and virology happens to be one of my areas, so I get to see a lot of things around the country. And I, I think Matt, Brad Austin's suggestion is a very, very good one to take your time not that you have a lot of it, but take your time in thinking about and what you might want to do to your existing practices in order to begin peeling away one of the uh, mitigating tools that you have in place. Um, because, by the way, it's not irreversible. I mean, if something goes bump in the night, I mean, I can't predict the future. It goes bump in the night. We have to be, all of us have to be ready to, shall we say, oh, let's, we got to go and start doing this. But I can ask, please, do consider everything you can starting immediately to, to boost not only your vaccination rate, but also actual participation by students, everyone in testing. I can't emphasize this enough. This is a very important tool that the more you add to it, the more powerful you're going to be able to be in getting to where all of us want to be. So... I'm not, I appreciate your time that you gave me tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that the Board of Health will be able to engage with you appropriately and come out with something that, that really, really works. But give yourself some time. And uh, I, 
I, I don't agree with Justin. I think we are beginning to see the beginning. Shall we say, I do see light. I've been working on variants for a while, and so far I'm encouraged. I thought I was hoping against hope the six new ones I saw were going to be, one of them is going to be the it boy, but they're all failing in the face of Delta. <laughs> mixed, mixed, mixed hope here. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate the commentary. All right. Uh, I'm just going to ask, it is getting late. We're going to, we have three hands up. Uh, that's all we're going to take at this point, And then we're going to move to a vote on this. Okay. Solomon Marini, please state your name, your street, and your question, please. Uh, Solomon Marini, 149 Hartwell. Um, I guess just first to comment that in the face of the rising cases, both in the town and the um, surrounding area in the state, this seems a bit tone deaf at this point. I understand that the, it's great that the vaccine rate in the, the school is up, but it does seem a, a bit off at the moment. Um, my other question is, if, if there were not masking in place at the moment, how many students would be <clears throat> needing to quarantine as close contacts to the cases that are happening? How much the loss of education time does that result in? And how are you dealing with students who can't be in school if that number goes up? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Lynn or Kelly, did you want to respond to that as far as the what the protocol would be for kids who are close contacts? I'm not sure if Lynn is still with us. If not, I can respond. Lynn, okay. is, Lynn is not right now, Kelly. Yeah. Oh, here she is. You're muted, Lynn. You're muted, Lynn. I, I've just made it to my car. Um, okay. <laughs> so if students are vaccinated, they are not, um, they are not defined as close con contacts requiring quarantine. So um, I'm not sure there, there's no, um, there's no, there's no requirement with regard to masking or not masking. I mean, the, the protocols for students that are close contacts are required related to, if I'm correct, um, the distancing and the vaccination status. Great. Thanks, Lynn. All right. I think we can move on to Laura. Okay. Laura Batrami, where'd she go? Sorry, one moment. Oh, there she is, okay. Laura Batrami, please state your name, your question, your street. Sorry, the unmute wasn't coming up. Um, Laura Beltrami, 30 White Pine Drive. Um, so I am a parent of four kids. Um, two are in the high school now. Um, I received an email, I think it was just yesterday, as a matter of fact, that um, my junior was uh, a close contact. And the reason that he didn't have to quarantine or be tested and that he could continue um, attending school was because I guess of three things, which one was both of the parties were masked. They were, you know, at that three foot distance and I guess both were fully vaccinated and um, sort of along the lines of Solomon's uh, question. Um, if one of those factors was missing, i.e. if one of them was not masked, especially the individual who tested positive, then my concern, if we go forward with this trial and trying to get the waiver prior uh, to January after all the holiday um, gatherings, is that he would have needed to quarantine, which I think would have been devastating because as a junior, you know, um, you know, especially with AP courses, you just, you can't miss a moment. Um, so I was very grateful that they had all of the um, parameters in place that allowed him to essentially continue attending class. So if we get a waiver and we do that and he, say that person again was not masked or one of them was not masked in the class. My concern, especially with the holidays coming up is that 
the parameters would be reduced. And then if someone does come up as a positive and then their close contact um, with that person that they'd be required to quarantine, um, is, is that correct? I mean, cause again, I'm just going off of the three parameters that I received in the letter um, that I got regarding the close contact. And it was an in-class close contact. I should clarify that. Yes, that's correct. I, if I, Chairman, if I could just comment, since I, I worked with uh, the school nurse on these notifications the other day. Um, the, the Laura is correct. Uh, she probably has the letter right in front of her. Um, and the close contact, this would change. We, we would have to get some type of clarification from Board of Health or DESE around what constitutes a classroom close contact. And if they are, this we're, we're on mass because of our trial period. Um, what does that mean? Do they have to quarantine? Right now they don't because they were masked. And Laura provided her own example from her own family. Uh, bulk of our close contact notifications have been exempt from testing and quarantining because they were masked in distance at least three feet apart. Uh, and, the, and Laura has had mentioned some other uh, criteria well as well for classroom close contact. So thank you for sharing that. That is an important thing to, for us all to kind of follow up on and f figure out how we would manage it at the high school. Can I just weigh in on that? The, the masking is, it's not like a, a three set, three set of criteria. I just I pulled it up just so I can clarify it for every everyone. Um, the exemptions to the close contact quarantine and testing protocols, asymptomatic, fully close, fully vaccinated close contacts, individuals who are asymptomatic and fully vaccinated are exempt from testing and quarantine respo response protocols. If, right, but if there are classroom close contacts, an individual who is exposed to COVID-19 positive individual in the classroom while both individuals were masked, so long as the individuals were spaced at least three feet apart, are also exempt from testing and and quarantine response protocols. But the vaccination is is the important factor. Oh, right. No, and, and I appreciate that, Lynn. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, but again, in the letter that I received, masking was one of the reasons that he was allowed to continue. So I guess my concern is that if we do this prior to the holiday gatherings, that we'll see a surge. And then if we get the waiver and we do not require masking of the vaccinated students, which again, I'm not against, it's just that if this is a threefold in class, you know, positive contact, that's my concern. Um, you know, being in the high school, and again, I have a junior and a freshman, and I've been through this, not during COVID in the, in the school systems in Littleton, but you know, when you're a junior, especially, and a senior, you know, there are academic things that you need to get done and, and missing a day at school is like missing a week, you know, in the lower elementary schools. Um, you know, he's involved in the play, he, you know, he works in the, in the school. So my concern, again, is that if we remove something as simple as a mask, to ensure that our children can remain in school, that is gonna be fairly detrimental to especially the higher grades in my opinion. Um, I agree with Brad that waiting till January, which is really only a couple of months, um, does not seem to be out of the question. Um, you know, I get what, you know, Justin is saying as well, it seems like we've been living this for quite a while. It's almost been two years. And the only problem is, is that, you know, parents of high schoolers really do feel, I feel more of a squeeze than the lower elementary um, kids, just because, and again, and, I, and it, not to say they ha are less than, it's just that there's so many academic things that the higher grades are required to do that, again, missing any time from school just seems really detrimental at their stage. That's all. all right. Thanks, Laura. Appreciate the comments. Thank uh, you. And last question, Greg, or a comment. Greg Tez, please state your name, your street, and your question, please. Greg Tez, 117 Whitcomb. 
Um, I, I just want to start, I, I guess I have a few comments and a couple of questions, but I want to start by just thanking the committee. I think that, um, you know, this conversation needs to happen. Um, I do want to also, um, you know, you, you know, so I, I guess first the questions, one, have have we checked with the high school whether this is enough time to implement such a strategy, um, you know, by which, you, by which, you know, the I guess the students that are vaccinated essentially um, will be allowed to now wear a mask and how that will be implemented because um, it seems very, very short. Essentially you have a half a week followed by a full week um, to implement this plan. So to Brad's point, I think that is, does seem a little premature and rushed. Um, and I do also completely agree with what Laura said and Brad, right? There's, we haven't given the five to 11 year old community in our town a chance to get vaccinated. And a lot of these kids have siblings in the high school and in the lower schools. So to, you know, reiterate what Laura said, um, pushing off to January really doesn't seem like all that big of a deal. And the third point about that, you'll be pressure testing the system at the absolute worst time for spread. We know last year, that the holiday spread was the worst. That month of December was where we really saw a kick up in cases across the country um, due to holiday gatherings. And you may actually set back your efforts if you get um, an undesirable result. Um, and along that, and I appreciate the, you know, the, the efforts to do this experiment, but um, the reality is, right, you, there hasn't been much school transmission in large part, simply because we've had masks in place. And once masks are removed, that variable changes completely. And pressure testing that during the season where we're likely to see the highest rate of transmission and before the five to 11 year old community, which um, still is largely not fully vaccinated, um, it just seems a bit, a bit rushed. So um, it, I guess those are my comments. Thanks, Greg. Can, can I just reiterate again? Um, that if you are asymptomatic and fully vaccinated, you you will not you're not a close contact, Ma mask or not, in classroom or not. Great, thanks, Lynn. Okay, at this point, I'm going to bring the motion to a vote. This is a roll call vote. Uh, I'll start with Tim Lynn. Lynn Rossius, yes. Okay, Jen. Jen Gold, yes. Brad? Brad Austin, no. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. Okay, I am in the unique position of, uh, doesn't appear my vote is uh, going to matter in the long run. Um, I could have gone either way on this, and you know, I think everyone's made great points. Um, there's, as far as the motion goes, the decision is made, and therefore I vote. Yes, uh, I will back whatever the committee chooses to do. Okay. That being said, we can move on to, and again, I would just reiterate that, you know, this is going to go through the Board of Health and uh, they may make changes. So. Can we get a little clarity about the pro I mean, the process? Is this something that the school committee chair and the superintendent approaches the Board of Health about? Um, is this... So they have a meeting... How will we notify the community of how this is unfolding? Yeah. They have a meeting scheduled for December 1st, I believe, um, where I imagine this would be an agenda item that they would obviously discuss and take a vote on and how to proceed. Um, I plan on being at that meeting. Um, I know Dr. Clenchy, if you will, will be there, but uh, any other thoughts on that, Dr. Clenchy, on how this will unfold? Uh, I'll be at that meeting as well. I mean, they, they will they will deliberate in, in, in public session and involve us in the discussion to to ensure that that they have a good understanding of of what we're we're wanting to do and and. Uh, a good understanding of our current mitigation strategies and how, how successful they're being, et cetera. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I'm really pretty confident. I can't say with certainty because I'm involved in the decision, but uh, knowing how cautious the Board of Health is, and rightly so, they, there will be some conditions put, put on uh, whether or not we can move forward. And I would venture to guess it would 
one of those conditions would be uh, the number of positive cases. Matt, I'll add, I think we probably need to, I, I know Mr. Zeldin attended the meeting and maybe others did as well, but we probably need to inform them in writing of our request. And I know they have a meeting December 1st. If they would be kind enough to have a special meeting before December 1st, um, that would be great as well. Um, not that we need a lot of time between December 1st and December 6th to put this into place, but um, if they wanted to have a special meeting so that they didn't end up having a meeting that went till 10, 10 at night, uh, um, might be a wise thing to do. So, um, okay. yeah. So, um, Dr. Clenchy, I don't know if you want to me to come in and work with you on drafting, uh, this and writing, a, a actual request sure. to I'll create a, a Google doc draft and send it to you, and then we can uh, both tweak it uh, before I send it to him. It does require a formal letter, by the way. I, I just uh, assumed we were going to do that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go with another comment I have. Oh, uh, it's important to know no matter what, what trial date we, we choose or the Board of Health chooses, th this is going to take a, a, a bit of time to get the information in. So I don't I'm not envisioning a process where by day two, everybody that uh, wants to that's uh, vaccinated is, is ready to have mask flexibility. It, it will be a process that, that occurs over a week or a week and a half or maybe two weeks. I just, I just don't see this happening uh, instantaneously. So regardless of, of what the trial date is, uh, the beginning date of the trial period. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thanks, Dr. Clenchy. Uh, so this brings us, we kind of just had this, but uh, we this is our second official uh, interested citizens. If you have any comments or questions before we close out the meeting. No questions. Okay, that brings us to subcommittee reports. Uh, Brad, tell me about CPAC. I got nothing. Um, I really actually, I, 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 maybe I have an email, but I didn't read. Um, they, CPAC really wanted that um, dyslexia screening presentation. And so once again, on behalf of CPAC, thanks um, to everyone who's involved in creating that. That's all. And they did, they did do their parent, their um, basic rights workshop this week. Yep. I knew that happened, but I, this has been a tough week for us personally. And so I just didn't keep up with that. I'm sorry. Can you want to say any words about it, Lynn, or? Um, it's just the yearly uh, Federation for Children with Special Needs uh, Basic Rights uh, Understanding the IEP workshop that's uh, that's done. It's a really it's a nice presentation, and um, the next meeting we'll have an update. Um, I asked CPAC to just give me an update on on how it was attended and feedback, but I don't have any of that yet. So more more updates to come. Thank you. Great, uh, Timlin, PMBC. Sorry, um, we did not have a meeting this past week, so um, I don't have anything to report. We haven't met in three weeks. They haven't met. No, they haven't. We actually, our last meeting, they didn't get the agenda up on time, so it was canceled the day of the meeting because it wasn't posted. That, so that was probably. And it. now their next meeting is scheduled for when next Wednesday night, and I don't believe we have quorum, so because of Thanksgiving travel. Yeah, that's a tough one to schedule for yeah. the night before Thanksgiving. Um, okay, we'll move to policy. I can hear from Brad or Tim. We need to meet. There's no, <laughs> we need to meet. We need to we meet, that's the report. <laughs> yeah. Yes, nothing to report. That's okay, report. and <laughs> Justin or Jen, budget? Yep, we had a absolutely thrilling budget subcommittee meeting last week, and it was so great that we've invited the entire school committee to our next meeting, which is going to take, which is this coming week. Yeah, um, everyone's been notified. We'll post, but we uh, last meeting we essentially went through um, what our spend rate is and where we think we're going to end up for the year, and we're starting to forecast and um, for the following year for the budget cycle, and it's fast approaching. There's a joint meeting. Monday as well uh, with FinCom and 
select board. So on that topic, so it's, we're getting in the middle of the, or starting the budget cycle process. So just great stuff. For the record, Justin, you sound sarcastic. I thought it was actually thrilling. So thank you, Kelly. And uh... <laughs> no, it was good. I'm just reaching for humor at this yeah, point. No. Yeah, sorry. Being a little deflated there. <laughs> no, Kelly, it's good. Kelly stuff. and Steve. Just kidding. I know I love my updates. Um, okay. That being said, I think that is everything we have. We don't have a need for an executive session this evening. Um, therefore, I will accept a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. A motion <laughs> made and seconded. This is a roll call vote. Timlin. Timlin Rossius, yes. Justin. Justin McCarthy, yes. Jen. Jen Gold, yes. Brad. Brad Austin, yes. That Hunt votes yes as well. Okay, we will see you all soon. Tune in Monday night for the, our, our joint meeting. It's going to be even more thrilling than Ju Justin's budget subcommittee meetings. <laughs> Everybody go to the high school play. Lynn, thanks for pulling over and helping us out with those last questions. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. <laughs> true true dedication. dedication. Yep. <laughs> I hadn't started driving yet. <laughs> all right, thank you. All right, have Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, all. Thanks, bye.